use R um, series that, they, that we've had in the last uh, month or so. Uh, so this is going to be uh, led by uh, Michel Lang from the University of Munich. Uh, he's a statistician and software engineer, and also by Bern Bischel. Uh, he's an investigator of uh, machine learning um, at LMU University. Um, this tutorial will be in English, but there are closed captioning available. You just need to press the CC button uh, towards the bottom of your screen, uh, and those uh, closed captions will be in Spanish. So we're going to switch between English and Spanish uh, for the introduction only. Uh, so, buenos días a todos. Muchas gracias por unírsenos a este webinario sobre Machine Learning con MLR3, eh, que es parte del de el ciclo de conferencias de Use R. Uh, este webinario va a ser dictado por Michelle Lang, uh, que es de la Universidad de Múnich, es estadístico e ingeniero de software, así como Bern Bischel, que es investigador de Machine Learning uh, y trabaja para la LMU. Um, Este webinar va a ser en inglés, pero tenemos nosotros disponibles subtítulos en español. Simplemente presionen CC en la parte de abajo de sus pantallas y saldrán los subtítulos. Los subtítulos están disponibles por las dos primeras horas debido a conflictos de horarios, pero eh, estamos trabajando para eh, tener subtítulos disponibles durante toda la duración de este evento. Eh, cuando subamos este evento al, al canal de YouTube de Arcor Solution. Uh, so this webinar will be recorded. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few things now. So this uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, oops, English ones. Uh, so I just need to remind you that you're going to be abiding by our code of conduct uh, and that as well as uh, use R, uh, which basically means that you just need to be nice to each other. Uh, we're going to be using Slido for your questions. Uh, the link is available uh, on your screen right now, uh, but uh, Michelle and Bern will uh, provide more details as well. Um, so this webinar will be made available later uh, through the Arcos Consortium YouTube channel. Ahora en español, este webinario va a ser grabado, va a estar disponible en eh, YouTube, en Arcos Consortium, como les decía. Eh, los sub subtítulos, si no los pueden acceder por alguna razón, directamente desde Zoom, simplemente pueden eh, dirigirse al link que está que ahora aparece en sus pantallas en la parte de abajo y también pueden eh, activarlos. Eh, vamos a utilizar la plataforma Slido para hacer eh, preguntas durante este evento y el vínculo está ahora en sus pantallas también. Y por último, quisiera recordarles que cuando aceptaron eh, o se registraron para este curso, están aceptando nuestro código de conducta, así como el de USRR, eh, que básicamente dice que nosotros debemos ser eh, respetuosos con los otros. Eh, las personas que estamos ahora de eh, co-host serían eh, las personas de Art Ladies Ecuador, eh, que somos eh, Solema Basurto de Art Ladies Guayaquil, eh, Eh, yo, que soy de eh, Art Ladies Galápagos, y también a Elena Chicaiza, que es de Art Ladies eh, Quito. So this webinar is being co-hosted by the Art Ladies Ecuador. We are three groups uh, that are doing this today. Um, so it's uh, Art Ladies Guayaquil, um, which is being led by Sulema Basurto, uh, Art Ladies Galápagos, which is led by myself, Denise, and also Art Ladies Quito, which is led by Elena and we should start now, so I'm just going to ask uh, Michelle uh, to take over now, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for having us. Um, I would like to point out um, the um, GitHub page we set up where you can find all the links uh, that you will need today. Um, it's um, also linked on the meetup page. Um, so if you um, have this link, you can click your way through to this page here. Um, if not, um, you can go to github.com slash mlr minus org slash user 2020. 
And then you find uh, this GitHub rep repository here, and um, well, you can find the, the PDFs for the slides here, and also some important links. Um, for example, um, here is a list of packages you need um, if you want to follow the exercises interactively. Um, and yeah, also some other important links. For example, here's a link to our book, right? So um, if you, um, if you if this is today a bit too fast, and maybe it will be, um, you can just look up everything in our book or in the documentation and so on. Right? Also, we recommend um, if you start with MLR3 to look at our sheet sheets, um, which you can also find here linked. Right? And um, for the first part, it would be um, yeah, something like this here. Um, if you have a printer next to your screen, then would be a good time to print it out now. Um, we are going to talk about three packages today. Um, the first one is the base package, MLR3. Um, then Bernd will take over and will introduce MLR3 tuning. So for tuning, as the name says. And then um, the last package will be um, MLR3 pipelines, which is a package for pre-processing, pipelining, and um, well, all sorts of stuff. Um, really exciting what's possible with this. Um, and as Denise already said, um, you can ask questions via Slido and we will, so we have three parts, uh, after each part we will uh, have a short break and answer some questions. Um, and we will also have a 15 minute break um, somewhere after one and a half hour. So, um, yeah, I think I've mentioned everything I wanted to mention. Um, I'll start with the slides. Bernd has nothing to add. Um, so, okay, I'm going to talk about the first package, um, MLR3. So this is the base package. Um, we have, I don't know, something like 20 packages now. Uh, I will give an overview of the packages um, at the end of my talk here. Um, so we are now just talking about the base infrastructure package here. Um, so why do you want to use a package for machine learning R? Um, as you might know, you might know that R already has many, many packages for machine learning. For example, there are packages for random forests, for, for SVMs, all stuff of things, right? And um, the main problem is that you don't have a unified interface for these. So if you want to do something like a benchmark, you want to find out which learner worked best on your data set. You have to do something like a benchmark, you have to do a performance comparison, right? And if you do this without an extra package um, like MLR or MLR3, you would start writing something like this. For example, you want to try how well an SVM works, then you take the E1071 package, for example. Um, there's an SVM, SVM implemented here, and um, this implementation supports a formula interface. So um, if you want to fit SVM on the iris data, you have to say, hey, this is a um, column where I want to predict labels for and use everything else as features, right? And then you get back something like a model here for the SVM. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do something like um, gradient boosting here from the extreme gradient boosting package, um, well, there's no formula interface supported. So you have to first split the data um, into a numerical matrix here. And then you have to provide the, the target column, the labels as a vector here. And yeah, so, two packages, two different interfaces, and if you want to compare something like 10 learners, it's often uh, like 10 different interfaces. And so you're writing boilerplate code and this quickly piles up to hundreds or even thousand lines of code. Um, so um, yeah, there are other packages um, which are, have the same goal, like MLR3. Um, you might know the Pidesa MLR. So, um, same guys, so uh, we are also the developers of MLR, and this is a successor here, the MLR3 package. And there's also carrot or tidy models now. Um, but all have this intention to solve this problem here, to make um, performance um, comparisons, comparisons and benchmarking uh, more convenient. Um, so what's in MLR3? We have um, objects for all machine learning. Um, stuff for, for tasks, we have objects for, for learners and for measures um, and so on. And this enables you to do 
performance evaluation and performance comparisons in an uh, easy and convenient way. Um, before we jump into machine learning, um, I have to quickly introduce you to R6 if you have, if you don't know it yet. R6 is the class system we use internally and not only internally, um, you have to work with these kind of objects if you want to use MLR3. And so you need something like brief introduction. It's not too hard, right? Um, R6 objects can be constructed um, by um, calling the class name and then the constructor new, right? For example, if you want to create a classification task, um, you call the um, object task classif and then the constructor new, and then you can pass some arguments here. For example, the ID, the data frame of data, and what's the target column. What you get back is an instance of this class, yeah? instance of task class of object. Um, these objects have fields which you can access, um, which just hold information about the object. For example, you can ask the task, how many rows do you have? Right, by just accessing the field n row. And the return value is here, integer 150. Um, objects may also have methods. So it's not just like a list, there can also be functions in there. So the um, task object also has a filter method. And you can say, hey, filter the task so that only um, the first 10 rows are kept, right? And everything else is discarded. And what's special about a six object is that uh, if you do this operation here, you mutate the object in place. So this is something you might know from, from environments in R. Um, this is also called reference semantics in other languages. So after calling the filter method here, and you don't have to assign this to, to the object task again, just by calling this, you change the object object task here. So if you again ask how many rows do you have, it's only 10 now. Yeah? This is something many people are not used to in R. But this is basically what environments are also doing in R. Um, there's another thing, there are so-called active bindings, um, which are supported. So these fields can be just, um, a value or an object itself, an R object, but you can also um, use a function which is then called automatically. For example, if you say um, the field n row, which is uh, in, which is actually an active binding, and you assign something, you get an error here. So because we have a function which is in code, we have a function internally which is in code which says, hey, you can't set this field, it's not allowed, right? So we can also use this a lot for, for something like argument checking. So if you have a task here and task can have properties and you can't assign null, so it's not allowed, but it would be allowed to assign some random characters here. So not that important to work with um, MLR, so we don't need to completely understand this, but we are talking a lot about active bindings later so that you have an impression what we are meaning with this. So this is basically just like a field, but internally function is called. This can have side effects. <coughs> so, okay, and this is um, all for R6 for now. Um, back to MLR3. Um, when we started developing MLR3, we uh, wrote down some, some stuff which um, we find important um, and what we have learned from the Codessa MLR. So um, the previous package MLR, um, used S3 um, as class system, and yeah, we, were, we felt kind of limited with this approach. So uh, we really wanted to do object orientation, and so we switched to R6. This was the first thing we wanted to really accomplish. Second, um, we wanted to uh, use data table more because, well, it's pretty fast. Um, and we also liked um, that it had, has reference semantics and that you can place complex objects in the fields. So um, it's also possible with data frames to be fair, but not that good, not that well supported for printing and so. And this allowed us to, to work with the data structures um, in a more efficient way. And third, um, we wanted to be light on dependencies. <clears throat> so these are our external dependencies. So we used R6, data table, uh, logging package, this uh, to create unique identifiers, um, some data sets in here and digest for cryptographic hashes. 
Um, and that's it. And all these packages don't have any more reverse dependencies or recursive dependencies. And there's some more um, packages in the, in the description file, but these are all developed by ourselves. So um, we, we don't count them here. So um, yeah. Um, now moving slowly to, to machine learning again. Um, we usually start with um, a tabular data um, for the most problems, right? And this is what is supported by now in MLR3. And, we. and um, we say that um, we have some columns uh, which are called the features, right? And one column or for a survival, maybe two columns, um, which are the target, for example, for classification, the labels we want to predict or for regression, the outcome we want to um, predict. Um, yeah, um, so the target column basically determines the type of task. If it's continuous, then you have a regression task. So if, if it is factor variable or discrete, we have a classification task, right? And um, for example, the iris data set, right? Here is the target column. This would be a classification task. And these would be the features here. And this is what we call the target. And for construction, we've already seen this, we call the task classif object and the constructor of it um, with an ID, the data frame, and, and the name of the column we want to use as target column. And we get back an instance of the class task classif. Um, if you print the task, get a nice overview here, for example, the dimensions, the target, what properties the task have, and what kind of features are in there. And you can access certain things of these objects. Um, for example, you can access the, the dimensions here again, the feature names, the target names. Um, you can query the data. You can, um, oops, sorry. You can um, subset or filter um, the task. And you can also expand it, combine columns or rows. And there's much more. But the more technical stuff is in the, in the uh, Mendel patch. Um, one last insertion here. Um, if you, so this is kind of bulky and lengthy calling these constructors. So we have something, um, we use dictionaries for, for all the objects that MLR provides for you. And um, so we have some dictionaries where we store, for example, um, uh, tasks we use in use cases or in, in examples a lot. And um, you can, for example, in MLR tasks, uh, the IBIS data set is in there, five to six more other tasks, and you can get the task out of the dictionary with this short form function here. This is for task, this is for learner, measure, resampling. Oops. And um, another advantage is that these dictionaries can be populated by their own packages. So if you load the MLR learners pack package, uh, you, this dictionary, MLR learners, um, will be populated with, I don't know, 20 more learners, right? And the, if you load the survival package, this dictionary now holds survival learners. So this is these uh, yeah basically what you have to remember. These short forms we are, will be using a lot in the next slides. So um, you can, for example, here um, query what's in there. If you don't provide any argument for this short form function here, and you see oh, it was in housing data set is there, breast cancer, and so on. Uh, and if you want to have a single object out of, out of the dictionary, you provide the ID here, for example, to get a, an instance of the classification iris task, you just call the task function here with the iris, a string, and you get back the object. Okay. And you can also um, convert it to a data table. Um, you can basically do this for all objects, I think, which are implemented as a package. So we love these tabular representations. So for example, you can here convert the, um, the implemented learners to a data table and then you can start subsetting it. For example, for predict type or uh, stuff like this, uh, many more um, columns here. Okay, um, so we are tasked now. Um, the next important thing is um, this data. We want to learn something, so we need learning algorithms. So this is basically what learning algorithms do. There are um, two stage. There's a training step, 
and a predict step. And in the training step, you provide the learner some data set, right? This is what we call the training data. And then the learner learns something about the data. It learns the parameters, its coefficients, right? And stores something internally, what we call the model. And then if we um, have another tabular data structure, um, we call the test data, we can um, provide it to the learner what we get from the learner now based on the learned model as a prediction. So this is the estimate for the target variable, right? Um, to construct a learner, we use this short form here, LRN for learner, and say we want to have a um, classification tree from the R part package here. Um, this, the learner has this ID, class of dot R part, and then we can just train it, right? So we have an object of, kind of type learner here, we call the train method, provide a task. The learner will update itself, stores the model internally, and we can also access the model, right? By accessing the field, um, dollar model, and what's in here is the <coughs> model as learned by or as returned by the R part function. So if you want, we can now exit MLR3 and call plot on this object here or something, something else. I don't know. Summary, whatever. Um, learners have hyperparameters, for example, um, this is um, the data table of hyperparameters for the um, decision tree. Um, we have stored information about these hyperparameters, the ID, the type, um, lower and upper bound, allowed levels, and so on, right? There's a little bit more in here. Um, this is really um, handy if you want to start tuning these learners or if you just want to look something up, which is the allowed feasible range or something like this. Uh, you can do this by querying the learner directly. Michael, is it okay if I add one sentence? Sure. So I think some people are wondering how to follow along uh, with respect to the code and so on. So maybe we didn't make this clear enough at the beginning. So um, the tutorial consists of three parts because it's MLR3, it's MLR3 tuning, and it's MLR3 pipelines. But each part actually contains two subparts, okay? So the first subpart is uh, either Michel or me presenting the PDF, right? And you're just supposed to listen there and it's much too fast anyway to type this and to go along with this, right? But we are going to do nearly exactly the same thing on a concrete use case after the PDF um, and these are linked uh, also on the GitHub page, okay? So um, I think we are mainly linking to the rendered out HTML. Uh, we'll also show you before Michel goes to that first use case, we'll also show you directly how you can download the R&D, okay? Which I think might be a little bit hidden but, and we should have linked to it better, but we'll show that and then you can really download this on your uh, machine and, and follow along with this if you wanted to, okay? But for, for now, just listen to this, uh, try to understand and the rough concepts, and then we're going to do this um, in the use cases again, kind of a second time, okay? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, so you have these hyperparameters in there and you can um, also set the hyperparameters for a learner by just assigning a named list um, to the field values of the field parameter set here, and then here, for example, we say the maximum depth for the classification tree is now one. And if we train the learner again, well, it will behave differently, right? Um, it will give a smaller decision tree here, um, for example, decision tree of depth one. So this is just a stump. This is really, really shallow tree. Just one split point, right? Um, yeah. Um, and then to get a prediction out of the learner, um, you have to provide a data set. Again, for predictions, the test data here, um, we have something which is called U data. There are two rows in there and um, values for all features, right? And um, we then can call the um, method predict new data of the learner on the new data frame or the new data data frame. And what we get back is a prediction object, right? And as you can already see here, this is kind of tabular. Um, we have stored the row ID. We have stored the, the true value or two response, which is, an A here because, well, it's not in the data, so we don't know it, but um, we could have opted to also um, provide it here. So we would have also stored it in the prediction. And here we have the, um, the predicted label from the decision tree uh, for the first column, uh, for the first row and second row. Um, yeah. 
we can also say the learner say that the learner should predict um, not only the labels but also probabilities. So um, to do this, we just set the field predict type to prop for probabilities, and then um, if we call the predict new data method again from the learner, we again get a prediction object. But now we have additional information in here. So not only the raw ID, the truth, and the response, but also probability for class Citosa, class basic color, and class Virginica. So for example, um, the decision tree is perfectly sure that the first row is Citosa, and um, don't know if it's where the color Virginica is 50-50 for the second um, second row. So yeah, it's just then just sampled, I guess. The label here. Um, so closer look at the prediction object. Um, you, you can again use a data table to um, get a tabular representation of the data which is stored inside. And there are also these fields or active bindings where you can access some of the data directly, for example, the response by just um, yeah, dollar response here. And there's some more stuff uh, which you can look up in the manual page. Um, so now we have um, trained the learner and get, got a prediction. Now it's time to, to score the prediction to um, measure how well the learner performed on the data set. So this is um, what is called performance evaluation here. Um, we now have here a learner which is already trained. So there's already a model in there. And we have some, some new data here. And we start by splitting the new data or the test data into, into features and target. The features go into the learner. And the learner gives us a prediction, right? And the um, true column or the target column, so the ground truth also called, um, we then compare with the prediction here um, using a measure. So this could be, for example, quadratic loss or something like this. Um, and what we get out here is a single number, which, is, yeah, um, just depending on the measure is low, if predictions are really good or, and high, if it's not just just uh, guessing or so, or the other way or depending on the measure. So just a comparison here with these two vectors, um, just a function which gives us, depending on these two vectors, a, a number. Um, to do this um, in MLS3, um, we first create a task um, where we also have the, um, target column in here. Uh, we could also do this with the data frame. We don't necessarily need a task to do this, um, but here it's done with the task um, on the slides. Um, so we have a learner and we call predict instead of predict new data um, because we're now providing a task uh, on the task here. And what we now get is the prediction with the um, truth column here, not an A, but actual values here. And then we can um, call the predict uh, the score method of the predict object and provide a measure. Here's the classification error, and what we get back is so. The number says, hey, you have scored half of the predictions correctly and the other half incorrectly. Right? So just, um, yeah, just counting how many are incorrect, basically, and then dividing by the number of um, objects in the prediction. So um, if you repeat this, this is then called, <coughs> sorry, uh, resampling. Um, for resampling, you first get the, the data, the complete data you have um, into two parts. First, the training set, and then um, uh, the upper rows here and the lower rows are the test set. And the test set you also divide into um, the features and the, the target. The training data goes into the learner, right? Where you again learn a model. And then you pass the test set, the features of the test set to the learner, get a prediction, compare it with the ground truth, and get a performance. This is basically exactly what we've did before with the train and predict step manually. But you, we usually do this quite frequently. So, um, and also not only once, but repeated because we could be lucky. Well, for example, if these, um, this test set here, the observations of the test set are really easy um, to predict 
then we would get a wrong um, impression about the real um, predictive performance we are calculating here. So we typically repeat it and then measure it, um, then aggregate the performance values we get. So this is what we are basically doing. We look at different splits of the data into training and test. So this is uh, the training and the grade out stuff is test stuff, um, part. Um, we calculate performance for each of these split. We get performance measure each time and then we aggregate it into an aggregated performance. And this is typically what we report for, yeah, for learner. And all of this is done by the resample function. So um, to do this in MLR3, again, um, we have to create an object here. We create a resampling object. Um, we use this shorthand form here um, to get a resampling strategy, which just defines what we are, how we are planning to split up the data. Here we say we want to do cross validation with five folds. This is what we've done here, right? And um, if you have created such a resampling object, we can pass it to the resample function here, third argument, and also provide the task and the learner. And what we could get back then after some computation is a resample result object. Um, again, we can convert it to a data table. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see here, now there are objects uh, stored in the, um, in the fields here. So here's the task and there are the learner, the resampling, the iteration and the prediction, all um, stored as objects. And we have active bindings and fields to get out information of this, of this resample result. So for example, you can call the aggregate method and provide a measure um, to do the performance evaluation basically. So what we've done here, right? So, um, by calling aggregate, we you calculate the individual scores and then aggregate these together into one aggregate measure. Oops, this is what is happening here internally. You can access the prediction, the merge prediction over all resampling iterations. You can also access individual prediction per resampling iteration. This is a list of prediction objects here. This first one, for example. Um, you can also calculate scores for these resampling iterations and so on. Um, the last part um, is comparing learners, um, and this is what we call benchmarking. So instead of um, doing a simple resample, we now repeatedly do resampling with different learners, and we can also repeat this with different tasks. So you get something like this grid here. So this is the accurate performance measures, measure um, which results from resampling from learner one and task one, learner two and task one, learner three and task one. Here we have a different task and also um, applied to learner one, two, and three well, in exhaustive grid fashion, right? So this is what we call benchmarking. And um, doing this is really um, easy also in MLR3. Um, here we load the MLR3 learners package uh, to get some more, um, some more learners populated in the dictionary. So we can, in this example, we want to load the K and M learner to compare with the R part learner. And here we have a list of tasks, the IOS data set, Sonar data set, and Wine data set, just small. Um, yeah. These are just some small example data sets. And um, then we build this design. Um, <clears throat> here's grid design, we say we want to apply each learner on each task using a five-fold cross-validation. And this design is then um, passed to the benchmark function, which does all the computation. And what we get back is a object again, a benchmark result in this, um, in this case. And we can also call the aggregate function, get back a data table. And well, this is the uh, important part. Um, here we access the uh, columns task ID, learn ID, and the performance measure. And see here, for example, for task ID iris, we've trained the learner. Um, classif.airpart, and we got a classification error of 0 0.06. Yeah. And we could now say, hey, um, K and N outperforms the decision tree overall task here, for example, yeah, just by comparing these numbers. Um, 
closer look at the benchmark result. It's always the same. Um, you can call it as data table. We have active bindings and functions um, to easily get the information out of there. And we also have um, a visual, visualization package, which is called MLS Revis. If you load this and call the auto plot function on a benchmark result, you get a nice summary. So you don't have to compare the numbers looking at them and just generate some box plots here and uh, draw your conclusions using these box plots. Um, one more technical aspect of MLR3 is the control of execution. Um, before you start the resampling with uh, the resample function or benchmarking with the benchmark function, um, you can choose a backend um, which defines how the learners are um, calculated, meaning in a, in a way um, how are they parallelized. So we are using the future package for parallelization. Um, so for you kick off your benchmarking with the benchmark function and you put this line here um, first, then the benchmark function will run on all your local cores, right? Just choosing a backend here for parallelization, everything else is handled then internally. So this is all you have to do. Um, furthermore, if you are doing some more large and comprehensive benchmark studies, um, you will encounter some problems usually because some learner will crash for certain hyperparameter settings or even Zac fold. Um, and it's always um, yeah pretty inconvenient. Um, so we um, support what we call encapsulation of learners. So you can say when the learner is trained, um, do this in a separate R session, for example, or do this um, in a special protected environment. For example, if you say here, this learner should be encapsulated the training step using the call up package and the predict step also using the call up step package. Then before the learner will get trained, separate R session is started in which the learner will be trained and the result will be communicated back to the, to the master. So even if the learner Zach folds, um, this won't tear down your um, R session so and you can continue computing. So this is really um, convenient for larger studies. Also logs are captured and um, you have the possibility to fall back to other learners, for example, a simple learner which doesn't back for it often, just to get predictions and do something statistically sound um, in the aggregation of the results. Um, some, some notes on how to get help. Um, okay, check these slides. Of course, also mentioned the book already. Um, if you have an object of MLR3 and you're unsure how to get help, you can always ask for the class. Here, for example, um, you get that this object BMR is of class benchmark result and R6, but then look up benchmark result and you will usually find something. Um, another um, new way to get to the um, respective manual pages um, that you just call the method help and something will pop up but this is not yet implemented for all objects. So we just started uh, doing this. Um, so these are the more, this is the overview of the most important parts. Um, for data, you have um, the, the task objects for classification and regression, and you can access um, predefined tasks using the TSK function. Um, same for the um, learning algorithms, you can use the LRN function to get a learner. You can call train and predict, and you, get, you will get a prediction um, for resampling. This guy here for measures MSR. Um, the resample function, of course, will give you a resample result, and the most important method is the aggregate method for the resample result. And for com performance comparison over multiple learners and multiple tasks, you see benchmark function, which will give you a benchmark result. So, and as Bernd already said, I will uh, shortly start uh, giving a, showing a use case on the German credit data. Um, but before, here's another slide um, that you get an impression about what is already there and what's uh, uh, still in the planning. Um, so this is our current ecosystem. In the middle is the MLR3 package. And um, well, where do I start? For example, to access data or handle with data, we have here 
uh, package to um, communicate with database backends, for example, uh, MySQL servers or something like this. Um, we have a connector to uh, OpenML database. Here's a vis visualization package, right? Here are the learners. Um, we have packages for feature selection here. Um, we have a few packages for tuning. Here, this band will be talking about MLS tuning in a few minutes. Um, and pipelines, oh, it's, oh, over here is pipelines, which will be the, um, the last package for today. And yeah, also for some special tasks, for example, for ordinal regression or clustering or um, survival analysis, we have some packages already. Okay. Um, any questions on Slido already, Bernd? Or should I proceed? Um, there was a little bit of discussion going on in the Zoom chat, uh, with mainly me posting links. Um, and I watched Slido, so I didn't see anything there. Okay. I hope it does work for everyone. And there's, because of your good presentation, there are just no questions. Uh, I Sorry, I just, I can see a couple of questions at the moment. Uh, should I read them out to you? Uh, well, it would actually better if I understand where I didn't see them before. Let me check. Ah, ah I, I, can see, I can see them now. Sorry. Okay, great. Uh, um, Michel, can you see them or should I? Okay, um, so let me, I'll, I'll answer the middle one first. So one, there's one question, what is encapsulation? So Michel tried to explain this. So if you run a large scale benchmark, right? You have like, I don't know, 20 different learning algorithms and on a couple of data sets. Some of these, I mean, because some of these implementations might be faulty uh, and you just, or you just might run into edge cases. So what very often happens is um, uh, one of the two cases. So either you get um, like a sec fault sometimes if you're very unlucky or even worse, the whole R process uh, runs an infinite amount of time. Yeah? So it, or it just runs for hours and hours and hours and never stops. If you're unlucky and you run into one of these numerical edge cases, that happens even more often if you later do like tuning and auto ML and so on. So what encapsulation means is that we run this computation of the benchmark resampling experiment in a fresh R session, okay? Which means if that goes down, um, it only tears down this new session, it doesn't tear down the master session because in the master session, all of the other experiments are also being run, right? And if one of the experiment goes down, you don't want that to kind of, uh, yeah, destroy all of the other results that you are computing, right? I mean, there's nothing worse than setting up an experiment in the evening, starting it for 20 hours, then you come back to your machine or to your cluster, and then everything is gone, right? Or, or it has just stopped in after 30 minutes because one process was faulty. So encapsulation um, is exactly this, spawning a fresh new R session, and we do this by using this call R package. Have a look into this if you want to uh, yeah, learn more details about this. This is not from us. We are basically just reusing this as we reuse future. And it's nicely combinable with uh, the future package. Uh, what else? Um, uh, conceptual questions. Does MLR3 have an ordinal SVM? Uh, answer is uh, currently no, but we are working on an ordinal package, which would include this. So uh, check back maybe in three to six months and then maybe yes. Um, so there is um, intermediate code, so to speak, um, to work with ordinal cask. At the moment, it's kind of not officially supported because we're not done with this yet. Um, uh, I couldn't follow. Could you please clarify the commands learner predict task and learner predict new data task? Ah, okay. So um, is the letter for validation with a new data set? So, um, well, these, that's a good question. It's actually very simple. So this predict or these two predict functions, they are both there to predict on new data, right? So the predict task function predicts on data, which is already included in the task, right? But very often in, so I think that's what very often happens if you do model selection or if you do, I don't know, a scientific experiment, you have all of the data uh, in your hands already. But um, later on in, in applied work, you create your model at one point in time, and then I don't know, three months later, new data comes along, and then usually the data comes along in tabular format, and in R you have it in a data frame, right, or in a data table. And in order to be able to also to predict on that, we have this predict uh, new data function, right? It's just basically what format the data is in, and we don't want, we don't want to force you to kind of merge your new data into the task, right? 
that's it. I hope that answers all three questions. Okay, um, <clears throat> to the use case, um, we have the MLR3 gallery, um, which is which you can also find linked um, on the project homepage or the GitHub page um, for this um, tutorial here, um, where we just collect use cases um, and yeah, basically collect use cases. And we have three use cases on the German credit data set. Um, we have one basic use case and uh, one for tuning and one for pipelines. And um, so if you, this is this one here basically sums up everything, most of the things you can do with MLR3. Um, this is really, really lengthy and there are many explanations in there. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the time to read it out to you and I, I don't think this would help. So I will do, yeah, I will, I will just try to um, do this here um, interactively and so that you get an impression how we are, how it's supposed to, how you are supposed to work with MLR3, right? I will just um, do this this way here. So first you need to, to load some packages. Here I load the MLR3 package. And um, the next thing would be to get load your data, right? Um, the German credit data set um, is a binary classification task where you have to predict if it's, if someone should get a credit or not. So if it's a good or bad person to give the credit and we have some, uh, 20 something personal demographic and financial features here. Um, I don't want to, do, to go into detail here. This is not about the data set, um, but you can all look it up here. Um, <clears throat> right, so stuff like um, previous, the credit history, um, the job, stuff like this, right? Um, you can, the data is from the R challenge package, um, but this is also an example task, so we could also get it by just calling the short name here, the short function here, um, turn credit, right? And we would get the task also. Um, the manual construction is, is covered here, right? So um, we have 1,000 observations of 21 features, or 20, 20 features in one target column. Um, there are 14 factor variables in here, three integers, three ordinal factors. Right, and what we are doing here in the in the gallery is now an exploratory data analysis. Um, basically, um, we are using the skim package. Skim uh, on the data. Oh, okay, it's not installed here. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So this just gives you a um, summary of all the factor variables here, the numerics, and so on, um, and then the next step here would be to use Data Explorer to get some plots. Um, again, not really the aim of the, um, this tutorial here to um, do this analysis. You might draw some conclusions, um, for example, that you have skewed distributions, that you have missing values, and that, that you have empty or rare factor variables. Uh, so uh, this is something you might have to react to or account for during modeling. <clears throat> but we will just, um, yeah go to the next step and start with the modeling. Um, we already have the task, right? Um, I cheated a little bit and just um, constructed it using the TSK function. Um, the next would be to create a learner, right? To learn something. Um, so these are the available learners, not, any, not that many, but if I load the learners package beforehand, here you will see um, all these learners are now available for me to, to use. And I can also uh, convert this to a data table. Uh, okay, um, doesn't work that well for the screen resolution. Um, yeah, but you get an impression how this is uh, meant to be used. Um, so here's the example. We are using logistic regression. Right, so I'm doing the same. Uh, this is called learner log back. Right. Ah. And now we want to train logistic regression on the task. So we could just call the train method and provide the task. 
and we get nothing back because the learner internally updated its model slot. So we could just ask, hey, learner, what is your stored model? And um, yeah, this is the output of the logistic regression in there. Um, <clears throat> we usually don't want to do this uh, on the complete data we have at hand, but only we want to divide it to a training a test set. So this is what we are doing here. We sample some of the row IDs and we sample some of the um, some ideas for the test set this is just done here by using 80% of the row IDs. These are just the integer numbers here. We sample 80% of them. And here we just say the test set is, yeah, all the row IDs which have not been used during training, during the training step. So we're just using the set of, set of function here, right? And now we can train the learner again and say, hey, only train on these IDs. And now we should have a different model. So can't see this here, but this is just trained on the, on the training data. And we can now predict on the test set by just saying, hey, learner, predict. Now we provide a task and we say on which row IDs of the task we want to predict. And this is um, the test set. And we get back a prediction, right? So um, this is all also covered here, and just some more commands. Um, let's do this. Um, so we have now prediction for this logistic regression, and maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe let's just cross them here for now to get an impression what is possible on the data set because the, um, the aggregate function of the prediction object. And now if we don't provide a measure as a default measure, oops. Ah, sorry, um, for the score function here. And if we don't provide a measure as a default measure for classification will be used, which is the classification error here. Um, yeah, if we don't want to have the classification error, but something more fancy, let's say um, area under the curve, um, we have to do something special before. We have to say um, the learner that we want to have um, probabilities as prediction. So this is what I can do here at the top. So yeah, now I've constructed a learner which will give me probabilities. Uh, I train it again. Um, okay, this would not have been necessary to see it again. But now the prediction object um, also includes probabilities. And now I can say here, um, score using the AUC measure. And yeah, so now I have the area under the curve here. Um, usually, usually it's a good idea to compare against something different, right? For example, a nonlinear model, because you already have a linear model here. Now, um, for example, against a random forest. Um, so first I will construct the, the random forest again um, using the short function here. And the so one is called, one I like is the ranger package. And I will also say um, to predict probabilities. So then I can train it again. I'll copy some lines from here. Learner random forest dollar train on the task and on the same training set I used before. And the prediction also on the random forest learner um, on the task and the same test set as before. Oh. And now I can also calculate the AUC and it's 0 0.8 and it was before 0 0.76, so a little bit better. So what I've now done is something like manual benchmarking, right? Um, on a single split into training test. Um, and well, the next step would be to do a proper benchmarking um, on this data set. And yeah, this is what we want to do now. Um, so I need to create a benchmark design. This is a benchmark grid function. And as you can see here, um, you need a list of tasks, you need a list of learners and a list of resamplings. Well, I have a single task, so I will give provide this here. A list of learners would be a list 
the basic regression and a random forest and a list of resamplings or well, I don't know. Um, let's do, yeah, why not? Cost validation with three folds, right? And I will also provide this here. Uh, this one is going to the name design. So we can have a look. This is just a data table. And we can then call the benchmark function providing the design. And what we get back is the benchmark result. Maybe and if I can add one sentence. Is it okay if I add one sentence? Sure. Um, I mean, this might be confusing maybe to people. Um, I think you explained this before, but I just want to emphasize this a little bit more. So also because we did this different in MLR2, I mean, I guess my, some of you might wonder why there's actually two function calls, right? Why is there this benchmark grid and then this benchmark call? So the reason for this is because the first or the input to benchmark is this data table, which describes what should be computed, right? And very often you want to have like every algorithm on every data set um, yeah, basically with every resampling type, very often there's just one, I don't know, tenfold cross validation. Yeah, but every learner on every data set. Um, but what this API design allows you is to also deviate from this. Yeah, you can very specifically design what you want to compute on what and control this. Yeah, by setting up this data table of experiments yourself. And we also later on uh, exploit this a lot in tuning um, yeah, in our AutoML packages. Um, so that really helps you or allows you to completely control what you want to benchmark and what, what you want to compute. Now that's the reason. Um, and then I guess many people will very uh, conveniently just call this benchmark crit function first, which completes the, which computes the complete cross product now of everything. Now, just to explain it, sorry. Yep, no worries. So you can also do this yourself, right? Just define a data table here. Um, and you uh, can just swap out some objects, but this will be the same design. Yeah. Benchmark grid is basically an abbreviation of what Michel just showed there, yeah? yeah? So this just means the first row is a resampling where you apply the first task you provided on the, um, the first learner you provide on the first task you have listed here using the first resampling. Uh, and the second is also resampling here by define, right? Um, so you can, um, yeah, so benchmark already um, executed, but you could also, um, this works now, future plan, say we want to do this uh, on multiple cores. This is all you have to do, call benchmark again. Uh, oh, okay, I think uh, the columns were not named correctly. in my manual design. Um, okay, so if you're running um, distributed, you don't get the nice lock output, but um, everything else yeah, should run exactly uh, in the same way. Um, to be fair, my computer is already pretty, um, yeah, and I'm pretty heavy load because of zoom and screen sharing, so I will just cancel it here. Um, so I hope it still the object from before. Yeah, so this is the benchmark result. Um, and we can calculate the uh, aggregate performance, right? Aggregate and say, hey, um, let's do area under the curve again. And yeah, this is the output, right? So um, the task German credit for both um, experiments we ran, the learner ID, logistic regression and ranger, um, and here the resulting scores. And as you can see, the ranger, the random forest ranger here, is a little bit better than logistic regression. Um, could also, again, um, create a plot of this using the MLR. This package and just call auto plot the benchmark result, right? And we get a plot. Which also, is, right? And now compare here the, the medians. So, um, yeah. 
Okay, there's much more in here, but um, I won't cover this because we have two other packages still to come. Um, and if there are not that many new questions on Slido. Uh, I did answer one or two extra ones. I think there's, there are no new ones and I think there's nothing in the chat of Zoom. Yeah. Also remember that you and can um, vote up questions, right? Um, at, the, so. at the moment it wasn't really necessary. So I just answered everything. Okay. In random order. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess then Bernd can take over with some slides on tuning and then we will have a 15 minute break. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Stop my screen share. Yeah, we, we started also a little bit late, so okay. I'll try to kind of um, be a bit quicker. Uh, so I'll try to screen share now. Let me remove this. Um, you guys, Michael, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Re everyone? Okay, good. I'll start now. Um, so this concludes the first part and I'll continue with the second part, which is on hyperparameter tuning with MLR3 tuning. So again, there will be a first part uh, covering, I don't know, the abstract concepts behind the package and some, some code examples on the PDF slides. And then we'll go through a second part of the German credit uh, data uh, tuning uh, um, use case of the MLR3 gallery, where I will basically redo the same thing on a more concrete data set. Now, with um, yeah, some more interesting outputs and results. Um, what else should I say? Did we cover, I'm not sure how much we also covered the cheat sheets. So if you later on, I mean, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by all of these new commands and so on, really print out the cheat sheets for MLR3. There's a good cheat sheet for MLR3 tuning and there's a pretty good cheat sheet already also for MLR3 pipelines. Really print this out later on if you kind of want to see everything at one glance on one or two pages. Um, okay, um, also one final organizational comment. So I had some problems with the layouting of the PDF, which uh, forced me to hotfix them. Um, I think directly in the first couple of minutes uh, when Michel presented, so I didn't change any content, but the last two or three slides of this thing here now have a better layout. So you might wanna um, download them again, but nothing else was changed, okay? and I. I think I pushed them again into the, our um, GitHub repo, I don't know, 40 minutes ago or something like this. Okay, so as most of you, I guess, will know, many um, of these um, non parametric non-linear machine learning algorithms that we like so much, like support vector like machines, boosting your networks and so on, they all um, depend a lot, their behavior that depends a lot on um, so-called hyperparameters, so control parameters that are not learned during the training um, part um, of the algorithm of the learner, but that which are basically an input yeah, to the training procedure. And we as users have to set them and very often we have no idea how to do that. Um, and of course we wanna select these parameters so our algorithms work well in terms of predictive performance. Um, good hyperparameters are all very often data dependent. So very often, um, good defaults are very hard to come by. And this, this is the reason why hyperparameter tuning or how we often call this nowadays auto ML, or we can also call that black box optimization um, has become such an important hot topic in machine learning. And what we are basically doing there is we are just trying out different configurations, different settings of the learning algorithm um, and cross-validating the algorithm again and again at our data set at hand uh, with respect to the performance metric that we're interested in, and then trying to kind of uh, sequentially improve upon um, our results. And we can do this in a very unstructured manner through grid search or random search, or we can kind of do this uh, in a more intelligent manner by using true black box optimization techniques like evolutionary algorithms, racing or Bayesian optimization and so on. And MLR3 tuning is there as an infrastructure package to kind of combine all of these methods and allow um, you to use them in any way you like and also to connect them to MLR3. Um, so the package is uh, simply called MLR3 tuning. Um, we kind of uh, restructured this a little bit 
some time ago, and there's also now kind of an infrastructure package in the background, which is called BBOTK, which is for Black Box Optimization Toolkit. I'll not really explain what function is in what package. It doesn't also really matter in, in terms of understanding. Just load the two. Um, yeah, I, I guess it doesn't really matter where the functions uh, live in, especially for this tutorial here. Um, so the reason why we did this is because we want to kind of reuse some of the infrastructure also in other parts. So we kind of extracted this away a little bit. Um, so how does tuning work like from a conceptual point of view? So first of all, um, we have a parameter space. And what our tuner basically does is in a continuous loop, it suggests hyperparameter the configurations, so certain yeah, settings, in this case it might be two parameters, yeah, uh, parameter one and parameter two here, yeah, and it's, um, while this tuning loop goes on, we suggest a certain configuration, then we evaluate its performance by using this resampling procedure or this benchmarking procedure that Michel um, already demonstrated to you, and we kind of directly call into this, and all of the results objects that we're going to create, create in MLR3 tuning will look exactly the same, maybe a little bit of extra information um, as in uh, Michael's MLR3 demonstration. So you don't really have to learn too many, well, at least not too many new container objects, okay? Um, and how to access data, which I think is quite good. And that was also um, a lot worse in MLR2. So we evaluate the performance, um, yeah, which is now this blue X here. And of course, now we want to feed that back into a tuning algorithm. The tuning algorithm hopefully kind of learns something from this evaluation. And it um, yeah, uh, suggests a different configuration. We try this out again through cross validation. Again, we get a performance value back, um, and so on and so on. And we could also even do this in batches. So some of these tuning algorithms can or want to evaluate multiple points in parallel, um, because that also obviously enables a uh, nice parallelization due the, during the tuning. Think, for example, of an evolutionary algorithm, so something that's like population based. Uh, there you could kind of evaluate the whole population in peril. Um, so um, what MLR3 tuning assumes is that we always evaluate in batches. Batches can be of size one. And then all of the evaluated performance metrics are fed back into the tuning algorithm and the tuning algorithm iterates. And of course, at some point we have to stop. Um, and um, so we need also a termination criterion in MLR3 tuning. This is called a terminator, also an object that describes when you want to end. So in order for us to now evaluate performance, we need all of these objects here, which you already know from Michel's talk. So of course, there's a learning algorithm involved. Of course, there's a task involved. Of course, there's a resampling procedure involved, think cross-validation. And of course, there's usually a single metric involved that you want to optimize. Um, and obviously, we need to extend this a little bit to define really this uh, tuning scenario. Of course, we also need to define our search space. So what do we want to optimize over? Um, yeah, we call this the search space, and I'll show how this is defined later on. So this would be something new. And of course, we need an object that's, that describes when we want to terminate. Well, that's just called the terminator. That's a pretty simple thing. So. Um, we now need to tie all of this together in MLR3 tuning. And um, so we have to create something which is called the tuning instance. That's kind of the major object. Object. So the tuning instance is basically kind of a bundling object that takes the task, that takes, takes the learning algorithm, takes the resampling procedure and measure the search space and the terminator object and bundles them together here in this tuning instance. So you could call this uh, the tuning scenario, or you could also call this, I don't know, the black box function that defines if you, how you map a certain configuration to an uh, yeah, outcome value, a performance value, okay? And then there's also the tuner, and the tuner is an algorithm that acts on the scenario and iterates, iterates, iterates until it has produced a final configuration which is good or optimal in a certain sense. And like I said, these four guys here, Michel discussed already at length, so I'll now discuss these two guys here a little bit more, and of course these two guys as well. So first of all, the search space. So the search space describes what parameters we want to um, optimize over and in what ranges and what data types these parameters have, okay? Um, so our basic object is 
for this is called a parameter set now that just bundles different parameters together. You have seen this already before because every learner also contains a description of what hyperparameter it has yeah, inside of it. And here we use this kind of in an alternative manner or a second time to describe our search space for tuning. And a parameter set is constructed by passing along or passing inside simply a list of parameters or parameter descriptions. So, and there's um, a couple of constructors for different data types. So there's a power of double for doubles. There's a constructor for integer parameters, for factor variables, we we'll also call them categoricals, for logicals, booleans, so to speak, and um, UTI, that's for untype, that's pretty useless for uh, tuning because tuning usually needs to know what parameter type it is, it is um, and how the ranges and constraints look like. And for numerical parameters, we have usually a lower and an upper bound. Yeah? So the ranges, what to tune inside of, so most tuning algorithms require to know this. And of course, for categorical parameters, we need to know the factor levels that we want to tune over. Well, for logicals, it's very simple. It's always true or false. So usually you don't need any extra information. And in a certain sense, you might don't need this at all because you could have also done this here with the parent factor. Uh, I guess that only exists for convenience and completeness sake. And um, if you want to see how this usually looks like, you have to load this extra mini service package here, which contains this description language for the parameters, which is called paradox. Um, so you just, just uh, describe your search space here by always saying param set dollar new, and then you create a list and pass in um, description objects for all of the parameters you want to tune over um, with all of their respected, respective site. So um, next thing we have to define the termination condition. So we have to create a terminator object from a terminator class. I'll go over this super quickly because it's very, very simple. So you, we have this TRM function here. Or I might pronounce this the term function, um, which is again uh, syntactic sugar to create such an object. It's again a dictionary. You can list the dictionary and here you can see all of the terminator objects that exist. So you can, for example, say, I want to stop after 50 evaluations. Um, you can also stop with respect to clock time. So you might want to stop, uh, I don't know, at 8 p.m. in the evening, or you might want to say, I want to stop after 50 minutes of computation, or you want to stop after you have reached an accuracy of 0.95. Yeah, it's all very simple. Um, you can just take the correct object, or you might, maybe you want to um, yeah, terminate when you have stagnated, when performance has not increased a lot. And it's also possible to combine all of these, uh, combine multiple of these. Yeah. So for example, either after one hour or when I have stagnated with respect um, to performance development, and then you can use this uh, meta terminator combo here, for example. Yeah, you can combine with end or or uh, constructions. Um, yeah, and it's as easy as just writing term number of evaluations uh, equals 20, and then you stop after 20 evaluations. Um, and the next thing is you have to choose a tuning method. So for that, you need the MLR3 tuning tuner class. That's also quite simple. It's again, it's a dictionary. Again, there's a little sugar function, which is called TNR um, to create from this. And here you can list the, the uh, tuning algorithms which are currently implemented. So you can do something like a grid search. You can do something like a random search. You can run a um, simple uh, simulate or actually not a simple actually quite complicated simulated annealing algorithm here genus a uh, there's nl opt also in there and or you can even specify exactly at what design points you want to um, evaluate uh, manually um, of course um, i guess you might some of you might be missing some of uh, some more advanced algorithms in there so we have already um, on github um, a nice version of hyperband um, and we will create very soon a new version of NLR MBO. So for model-based optimization, invasion optimization, currently working on that. Give us maybe one or two months so that we have a prototype that we are comfortable with publishing. And I, I think then you also have some pretty um, yeah, efficient techniques at your, at your fingertips. So you load the tool tuner um, that also loads all of the service, all of the underlying packages you need. Again, you you might have to set some control parameters. So for example, we can create a grid search here. 
and we can set the resolution parameters to three and resolution means so for every numerical parameter in a grid search we discretize that to three values uh, so if i take this val if i take my k from the k and n and i uh, want to optimize in the ranges from one to 20 so resolution three means that i'm uh, evaluating k equals one k equals 10 in the middle and k equals 20 uh, at the upper end of the spectrum and you can also see here some properties uh, so what the tuners can do, what parameter classes they can work on, um, the batch size settings and so on. And of course, um, the strategy parameters that we have set here. But except for that, it's not very complicated. It's basically just you construct the thing and that's it. Um, yeah, and there's usually this batch size parameter, which is important for parallelization. So I don't want to go into details here too much because that's a bit technical. And then you tie all of this together. So first of all, you create the tuning instance. So that's basically just a very long call where you pass all of these objects in here. I've explained all of this. And because I'm using grid search, and grid search always has a finite amount of points to evaluate, and usually want to search all of them exhaustively, we can also use this terminator none here. So there's not a specific uh, termination setting. Now we just finish when the algorithm thinks it's finished. And um, after we have created this instance here, the scenario, so to speak, the tuning scenario, we just do tuner dollar optimize on the instance. Yeah? And that gives us back um, and also stores in the object an archive of all evaluations. And it also returns to you um, a data table that contains the optimal settings that were found during the tuning process. So this looks a little bit complicated, I guess, or the middle part here. So uh, let me explain at least parts of this. So the first columns here are simply the parameters that you're optimizing over. These are all always like scalar parameters because um, Paradox doesn't allow anything else. So these are just regular columns here in the data table and you can just easily see them, access them and work with them. And then here the last column is always this respective associated performance metric that is associated with this optimal configuration that we have found. Here, you also have two different ways of kind of specifying this optimal configuration. So I'll skip. So there's two things that can change this configuration. So later on, I will also show you how to do parameter transformations. So you can kind of transform your parameters into log scale and so on. And this stuff is stored here as a list. And you can also, maybe the learner itself has also some constant settings associated with it. So what is in this list here is what is actually being evaluated on the learner. So these are the transform parameters also with other constant settings. Yeah? So this is kind of what is really being evaluated. And this is here what the tuner of the optimizer is actually searching over. Okay? And if you don't understand this now, it doesn't really matter. So in most of the simple examples, all of these things here completely coincide and there's not a difference between them. And we have technical information online to make this clearer. Um, and here I'm doing now exactly the same what I showed before. So I'm just doing this with a few more evaluations. So here I run my grid search now with a resolution of 20. Again, I create my tuning instance. I optimize over it with my grid search. I print out the results. And what you can also see is here now how I can nicely access the instance after I have run the tuning and I can access what is called the archive slot and turn this into a data table. And the archive slot now contains every evaluation, so with every parameter setting and with every um, yeah, associated performance metric. And it looks exactly as this here, yeah, just a longer table with more rows and every evaluation that the grid search has performed or that any kind of tuning algorithm would have performed is in there. And from this, because it's a data table, we can nicely now plot. So I'm here plotting this trace, or I'm, I'm plotting this uh, K versus associated classification error. So you can see which Ks actually work quite well and which work less well, right? So the optimal settings would be something like, I don't know, 13 or 14 yeah, for my K and N on this data set here. I mean, the experiment is more or less a toy experiment, so it's not that interesting. Um, here's a recap. I guess I'll skip over this because um, it contains nothing new, it's just the code on one page. I guess it demonstrates to you how simple tuning is. Do the, I mean, I guess what's not in here is the parameter set definition, so I guess that should be here. The instance, tuning algorithm, optimization, that's it. Uh, 
Okay, some at least a couple of um, do I have some minutes left for this? Well, maybe a few. A couple of words on parameter transformations. So sometimes we might not want to optimize over an evenly spaced range of parameters as I did before. So um, for example, as a motivation, so if you look at k equals one versus k equals two, so the second thing here is twice as large as that one. So we might say there's a big difference between the two, but I mean, and it might be interesting to kind of evaluate both of them, but do we really care about the difference between k equals 101 versus 102? So there's a lot of parameters where you kind of want to, um, yeah, optimize them on different scales. So other standard examples, for example, um, are regularization parameters where you want to try, so the C parameter in the support vector machine or the lambda parameter in regularized statistical models, very often you want to optimize them um, over a range where you have uh, values that are very close to zero and then values that are also very, very large and very far away from zero. And then the usual trick is to optimize them on a log scale. And you can do this in a very general manner in MLR3. So you define your parameter set and then you add a so-called transformation function to the parameter set. So what does that mean? So what I'm doing here is now I'm creating kind of a fake or temporary parameter, k before trafo. I've also called it k, I guess, it doesn't matter, just to make this more explicit. And we are optimizing this from um, log one to log 50. And now I'm creating here a transformation function, which actually does x of that and then rounds it back to integer. So what this will do is we um, evaluate a lot of values here, which are closer to one, but it will have larger gaps between, well, larger values of k, okay? And another very um, regular way of defining this, uh, for example, for the support vector machine, you might have seen this before. So if you optimize over the C parameter or, the, or a kernel width parameter, you very often optimize from something like minus 10 to plus 10, yeah, in the tuning. But in reality, what you mean is actually two to the minus 10 to two to the 10, yeah? So two to the minus 10, very, small values close to zero and two to, uh, two to the nine, two to the 10 large values with larger gaps. Yeah? And in this case, you would write here something like param double. Um, it goes from minus 10 to 10. And then your transformation function would just be um, yeah, C equals two to the X, okay? Um, and the nice thing about uh, def designing it like this is you can do any type of transformation here that you want, right? So you can kind of create fake spaces that the tuner is acting on, and then this transformation function um, kind of converts it into the uh, space that you wanna have the learning algorithm being run on. So I guess that's more of an expert option for people who are a bit more used with black box optimization and hyperparameter optimization. Yeah? And the nice thing is also because the trafo acts on the complete parameter set, so it's not a setting per parameter, it's kind of a function, it's an R function, that acts on the complete parameter set. So this X here is a list of all parameter settings for this parameter set. And um, you, can, you can even do multivariate transformations, right? You don't have to do it on a per parameter basis. You can act on the complete configuration and transform it into anything else. So the only thing that is kind of, uh, I don't know, required is this X here will always come from this parameter set. And what you compute here, uh, this list, that must be acceptable by the learning algorithm. Yeah, that's kind of the contract model, so to speak, so that um, this will work. So in this case, what is Opera uh, transformation doing? So you can see here how, um, yeah, we, um, how the tuner thinks it optimizes on this space, while in reality, we're actually evaluating here on this space, yeah, values. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I explained already, what this lock space thing does, right? Um, and we just call this here again, just looking at this, so there's not a big difference. Um, we can also plot this again, so there's also nothing new in here. So I'm now plotting this k before transformation, yeah, which I guess is a little bit, I don't know, the, the scale might be a bit confusing for people uh, because it's now this, this um, yeah, numerical scale or this uh, double scale, which goes from zero to four. But in reality, um, we are actually optimizing from zero to 50. And, this is also why this, um, yeah, let me show this again. 
why this X domain here is interesting, right? Because this here contains the, what the tuner is acting on, yeah, this before the transformation, and this guy here contains the configurations after the transformations, which I guess are more interesting to people um, to later analyze. And I've shown here both. If you dislike that these parameters here are kind of, um, I don't know, hidden down in a list, you, this, this archive thing here and uh, many of our data tables that we are supplying with MLR3 have these unnest functions or unnest options. We can kind of unnest everything from the uh, list and then it will create separate scalar columns in the data tables. You can easily access that, which is pretty convenient. So finally, um, I guess no um, hyperparameter tuning uh, talk is complete um, without referring also so to nested resampling, so I don't want to go into theory here so much, so I'm assuming that most of you know that we need to perform nested cross-validation uh, or train validation test setups to um, estimate uh, learning, or learning algorithm performance in an unbiased manner if we do um, hyperparameter tuning. Um, otherwise, if we only kind of, um, if you optimize on the cross-validation for performance estimation, this will create um, optimistically biased results and we shouldn't do this. So in order for us to achieve a simple nested resampling through MLR3, what we are doing here is we are actually creating something that's called an auto-tuner object. And what the auto-tuner object does is it's basically, it basically creates a two-step procedure. So it, as a second step, it really runs your learning algorithm with the optimal configuration and the first step here is this tuning thing. So it basically does what I've just shown to you. It runs the tuning completely first until completion. Yeah? It computes the optimal configuration here, and then it finally trains the model on the past in data set with this optimal configuration. And let me just kind of, uh, I don't know, soft, in a software engineering manner, tie, or, uh, yeah, so, yeah, tie a box around this. Yeah? And we create a, we kind of create a coupling mechanism that runs the tuning first, and then the learning algorithm, and this is what is called the auto tuner. And the nice thing is, if you cross validate this thing here, yeah, this has a now an outer cross validation and an inner cross validation in the tuning, and this kind of automatically does everything correctly because you cannot cheat anymore. Um, because uh, in the outer loop, um, yeah, always fresh test data is being used. If you find this confusing and you don't know nested resampling, really pick up, um, I guess, a good book on machine learning. Um, evaluation. I've also, I guess, published papers on this. We look this up because it's pretty important for practical work and um, proper evaluation. So many people have done mistakes here. Um, nice thing about MLR3 in terms of software is it's super simple. You can now just do the following. You create an auto-tuner, which takes your learning algorithm. Um, you can even pass in some constant settings here. You uh, create an inner resampling or pass in an inner resampling. So this is what is being used during hyperparameter tuning. Um, here you specify the metric that you want to tune over, you specify your search space, you specify your terminator, termination criterion, and you specify your tuning algorithm, and all of this stuff here you have seen before. So from here to uh, here, this basically defined the tuning instance. Well, I guess this also needed the task. We can't pass this in here because this will create an, yeah, an abstract learning thing that can be trained on anything. And this here was the tuner. But all of these objects you have seen before, we just now tie them all together in the auto tuner. And what you can now do is you can, this auto tuner is simply an MLR3 learning algorithm. Yeah? It behaves, it's completely connected to what Michel has shown to you. So you can run every method that Michel has um, taught you on this thing. For example, you can train it. And if you train this, this will run this very complex process here. It will run the tuning first compute the optimal configuration, and then fit the model on the task with the optimal configuration. And this is what I'm doing here. Uh, you can even now see the optimal settings uh, that were computed by this, uh, if you access this here. Um, you can also um, do this uh, somewhat lengthy call. So I guess we should probably cr uh, create an active binding for this. Uh, you, can access, um, in this uh, you can access the complete archive again. So everything that basically led to this optimal configuration while tuning was being run in the auto tuner. Um, or you can resample the thing. So you can resample your auto tuner here on Iris 
with an outer resampling now, um, store everything that's being computed, and that now really computes nested resampling. It gives you access to all of the optimal configurations. It gives you access to all of the optimal, um, yeah, all of the archives yeah, of all outer loops and so on. Um, again, um, some of these calls might be a bit lengthy in the beginning or hard to remember. This is all covered on the sheet sheets. Um, so I guess take a look at the book um, to, to understand the underlying principles or rewatch what I did here. And then later, later on, if you just want to remember how you have to kind of, uh, yeah, how the API looks like, have a quick look at the um, MLR3 tuning sheet. It's one page, it's all in there. And that, uh, I guess the last, last parts of the sheet really explain again how you can access all of these results. What is being computed here now by, by this resample function, uh, the, the performance metrics, the, they, these are guaranteed to be unbiased and proper. So let me check how I am in terms of time. Uh, a little bit slow, but nearly okay. So Michel, did you answer some questions already? Are there some that I should? Um, yes, I answered some um, by web replying to them. Um, there's one. Because we um, would, yeah, you want. To so I would suggest that we maybe answer that we answer all of them now, and then we go into the break. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So first question is, um, uh, is there a rule of thumb um, for the tuning time? Um, or no, for the tuning of course not. Well, this? well, this is actually a very difficult question. So, I mean, not really. We also have a hard time kind of coming up with perfect termination criteria. So I guess many people set this to, um, uh, to I don't know, how long they are okay with, with waiting, yeah? Um, so this, I, I think it depends, right? It depends on the space, how efficient is your tuning technique, okay? So I could give you, I guess, some rules of thumb for some more advanced algorithms, which we didn't cover here, but uh, yeah, I think that's a bit out of scope for this. So I think that really basically depends on your preference. Um, what I would probably do is do, a, I mean, in practical terms, I would think about how much time am I actually okay with being waiting, with, with, with waiting and then combine this with the stagnation thing, okay? So for example, I would be okay with 20 hours of tuning, but if it's stagnating, please then stop, yeah? As well. I guess that would be my answer. The short answer would be depends. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question, uh, maybe more on the MLR3 part. Um, what do we do if we want to have a custom implementation of some algorithm? Um, <clears throat> do you mean a tuning algorithm? And I'm not sure, maybe a learner also. Maybe you can open the, the book. And well, the um, chapter there. yes, I will. Um... So let me maybe start with the learning algorithm. So I'm not going through this now in detail, right? Because that's no, no. a bit technical, but I'll no. keep it short by saying it's simple. So have a look at chapter six. It's about extending. So this at least explains to you how you can add your learning algorithms. And there's a template piece of code. Just use that. Maybe I guess also talk with us because we have some infrastructure in place to kind of test all of these things very nicely on GitHub uh, and run standard tests on them, uh, which actually helps a lot um, with discovering also uh, flaws and bugs in the underlying implementations. Yeah? So not this connector code, but the algorithm itself. Uh, it also explains how you can add new measures. That's even simpler. That's, so that's basically one or two lines which really look like the formula, the mathematical formula of the measure. And uh, for the third thing, for pipe operators, so that uh, refers to the third part of the tutorial. So how, how can you add like, uh, operators for pre-processing and so on and for feature extraction. Um, we haven't covered how you can add new tuning algorithms. Uh, I guess we should put that into the book, but it's also not very difficult um, because the other thing you could do is you can just kind of take a look at what we do in on GitHub. So for example, we can go to MLR3 tuning, um, we can go to the R code and you can, I mean, I don't know, maybe have a look at, I don't know, maybe have a look at Gen SA. I mean, um, uh, wait, maybe not the best example. 
Yeah. Oh, well. Um, no, I guess. I, I think they have all been moved to uh, yeah, that OTK. Yeah. yeah, that was refactored. So if you want a new, you would have to add this here. I guess in this, in this instance, it's probably easiest to open an issue on GitHub and just request that. But just to show that this is not so, I mean, we have implemented them here because you can use them, that, them in an even more general sense. But this is how the code looks like to connect to an optimizer that already exists, okay? I, I mean, that's five lines, okay? And these 10 lines are just there to describe the strategy parameters of the algorithm. Um, and uh, you can also have a look at our uh, super uh, complex implementation of random search, right? Which is here, which is just sampling points randomly. Obviously, that's also very simple in R. So what you can just do is you can basically copy this type of code, uh, exchange the inner parts with your own tuning algorithm, add this locally, yeah? Just load this or source this locally and you would have a new tuning algorithm in ML3, okay? I guess if you're doing this for interesting stuff, open an issue and talk to us. But if the algorithm already exists somewhere, it's easy to connect it. I mean, that's the whole idea behind the package. Okay, Any I would suggest stuff? to first have a 15 minute break and um, so that I can um, order the questions a little so, bit. Yeah, and we are also kind of uh, getting um, uh, nearly out of time. Yeah, quickly, so, I guess. Yeah. Um, so my suggestion is we meet in 13 minutes. So that would be five minutes to seven, at least on my, I don't know, German clock here. Um, so in 13 minutes, we meet again. And I guess everyone can just mute their microphones. Um, please, I guess it's probably not a good idea to leave the Zoom call because I'm not sure whether you can get back in again. Um, have a cup of coffee, take a deep breath. I think we already covered quite a lot. See you again in 30 minutes. Eh, por si acaso, en Ecuador, eh, los 13 minutos serían a las 11 y 56. Entonces estaremos más o menos 5 minutos antes de la, del mediodía. De vuelta. Gracias. So if you are in a GMT minus 5, uh, we'll, have, we'll be back at uh, 11.55 around that time.
Hello? Hi. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not. It's very hard to say whether we should wait more or not. I guess we just go on, right? It's, it's five minutes to seven. And I guess I can hear your kids in the background. <laughs> um, so I answered more questions on Slido. Um, and except for one that I don't understand because it's very short, um, I think I answered everything. So I would just now continue. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, uh, sh wait. Um, Michael, you can see my just checking, just making sure that you can see my R Studio now, right? Yes. Uh, can you yeah, kind of read? Um, should I increase the font size? This if you help, could, yes. that would be great. Thank you. Appearance? I, I can't, sure. Uh, so I usually also use Vim, then, uh, so I'm not too good with Zoom. R Studio. Okay. Yeah. And set this okay. to 100%, maybe? Yeah. Like that? Does that, does that work for everyone? So, okay, so what did I do? So this is here the second uh, post. So this is uh, MLR3 tuning on the German credit data set. Um, like the HTML output is linked in our material page. Um, I also, in the Zoom chat, I also told, I mean, if you click on this GitHub icon, yeah, on the gallery post on the top, top right corner, you can also go to the GitHub repository where the source code of the, the distill thingy uh, lies and you can also download the RMD. So this is an RMD file. So I'll just open the RMD here in our studio. So that makes it easier for me to kind of copy paste the thing into the R console. So Michel, I think already explained the first part very well, right? So how to kind of benchmark uh, algorithms on the credit data set. So now, of course, we could also use the benchmark function to try out different algorithms, to try out different configurations, to see which of these works a bit better. Um, and optimize on this, but A, this is uh, inconvenient, right? And B, at some point, it would become cheating because you're optimizing on the cross validation. So I'll just go through the motions again to show you how to do this with MLR3 tuning. Before I do this, let me just set some chunk options just for layouting, uh, load some stuff and set some seats. Um, uh, so the first thing that's maybe interesting to you is this here. So um, every package in the MLR3 universe is um, kind of um, operated by the same logging mechanism. So we use this uh, logger, LGR logger package, and you can just always say get log logger package name, and then you can set the threshold. So you can, for, so for example, because I will now be calling into quite a few packages, right? Especially I will be calling into Michael's MLR3 package, and I'll, so internally I'll use the resample and benchmark function that creates a lot of logging output, right? Which is nice if you just do normal benchmarking, but which becomes super annoying if you do lengthy tuning runs. I'll set this here to warn, so I don't want to see this. But for black box optimization, I'll set the threshold to info, so I do see which configurations are evaluated. Uh, and actually, in the gallery post, I think this is also set to warn to, to reduce output and length a bit. But here, I guess, for the live tutorial, I'll set this to info. So I'll just again skip through the text. So first we'll just load a couple of packages. So uh, that's not very interesting. You already know this. So of course we load MLR3. We load a bunch of different recommended learning algorithms. Um, we load the tuning package and we load paradox. So we can talk about parameter spaces. And let's also set the theme for ggplot. And now we'll start. So first of all, let's just uh, get our hands on the example task uh, of German credit. So I'll just load this into the session. Uh, I will not enable parallelization here on my laptop, but if you have a faster machine with more cores and just want to run the thing faster, just enable future here with plan multiprocess. Um, so before I start with tuning, I have to, of course, now specify how I want to evaluate configurations through resampling and German credit data German credit data task is of medium size. So very often our standard here is to use tenfold cross validation. So I'll do that. I will also instantiate that. So I'll really create all of the splits. Um, so later on, because I'll try out different algorithms and different configurations. So I'll really make sure that um, 
I will all evaluate them on the same split to reduce variance in comparison. So most of our functions like benchmark and tuning and so on, I kind of do this internally. So you don't, if you forget this, I would say in most cases, yeah, we don't have to worry about this, but here just to make sure, especially when I want to compare different algorithms, I, I, I just um, yeah, I want to make sure that this is instantiated and we're always using the same splits for every uh, comparison. And I can even take a look at this. So if I wanted to, I can see now in the instance, I can see the row IDs. So I can see here, for example, the first fold. So which rows, row IDs or which observations are in the first fold. And I guess if I click here uh, a bit more, uh, you can see, okay, that's the, yeah, that's the 10th fold and uh, in between are the other guys. And as before, I will now use um, a K nearest neighbor method as my classifier for German credit, I will use the KKNN package. That's a nice flexible implementation of the K nearest neighbor algorithm. And I'll set predict type to prop to predict always probabilities and not only hard classes, hard class labels. And here you can also see how I'm setting now a specific um, constant hyperparameter that I'm not tuning in the beginning at least. I uh, set the kernel of the KNN method to rectangular. Um, so as a next step, um, we have to now decide which hyperparameters we want to tune. And if you don't want to read the documentation of KKNN, you can also ask MLR3, Michael showed this already too, which parameters exist in KNN or for, in, in KKNN, I should probably say. So you see the K parameter, you know, the number of nearest neighbors. You can see um, a, a setting for the distance function, so which norm to use, so L1 norm or L2 norm, so Manhattan distance or Euclidean distance or something numerical in between. Um, that's a double parameter. Um, you can see this kernel here. Uh, that's the kernel function that is based that basically weighs the example in the distance computation and uh, whether you want to scale features before you use KNN. And usually, I guess, if you know KNN from a more algorithm or theoretic, uh, theoretically minded course, you know that um, it's a pretty good idea to scale features before we use KNN and you will also see this later on uh, in our empirical results. So of course now I have to specify my search space and I wanna keep it simple in the beginning. So I'll only tune over K. So I go from here from three to 20 in this example and I will also tune over the distance parameter but I will only do this in an, uh, yeah, as an integer parameter. I could have also used the double here because uh, we can use kind of an L L distance type of metric, yeah, where this distance is uh, yeah, a real value. But here, I, to keep it simple, I want to try out the values of exactly one, two yeah, as integers. So let me define this with this two. And now I'll go through this quickly. I create the instance as before. I've, I think I mentioned this now five times. Pass in the task, pass in the learning algorithm, pass in the resampling, specify your measure. So we'll use here classification error to optimize, pass in the search space. And because later on I will use grid search in the beginning, I'll just set the terminator to none. So, okay, let's execute this too. And we have seen before um, how to um, set up grid search. So we use TNR of grid search. I set the resolution to 18 and I set batch size to 36. So that might be interesting. So first of all, what, what does resolution 18 mean. So what this means is that we are using for this guy here, we're actually using 18 different values. For this, we can't, we can only use two, right? It's because it's an integer parameter that only goes from one to two. So this means in the cross product of this space, there's 18 times two different configurations. So there's 36. And because grid search is uh, embarrassingly parallel, right? There's no interplay between the different evaluations because it's such a, I don't know, stupid, simple algorithm. I now set batch size to 36, which means if I would enable parallelization, everything would be valued in parallel, okay? Because nothing, nothing is sequential, nothing depends on each other. So what, this would kind of enable maximal parallelization, yeah, so to speak. And on my laptop here, it doesn't matter because I'm just using one core because it's uh, yeah, kind of a small and yeah, it's, uh, yeah. small laptop. Um, okay. And um, I can now take a look at this instance here and have a look at the results lot. And what I get back from that is something super uninteresting. It's just null because um, I haven't run the tuning yet, okay? So it's just empty. 
So we can now use run the tuner with the optimize function on the tuning scenario. And if we do that, you can now also see here that it's starting to tune and running and evaluating 36 configurations. Um, yeah, we just have to wait a little bit, I guess one or two minutes to see how the result looks like. I did test this out before, so I guess we just have to be a little bit patient here. So for longer runs that come later on, I have pre-computed the results, but uh, I'm a pretty impatient person. So let's see how whether I can make it uh, for 60 seconds. Is there anything else that we can answer in the meantime, Michel? No. Nothing new in Slido. Come on. Okay, it's finished. So I guess I could explain also the logging a little bit here. You see timestamps. You can see this logging level, so this info, right? Uh, you can see here we are optimizing two parameters. Uh, you can see we also print out which optimizer we use, the terminator. You can see that we are, have to wait for 36 evaluations. Um, and here we can now peek into the results. So I guess you can see this here. Okay, something is wrong with my, what is, I don't know, I guess I messed up something in our session at the moment, so this shouldn't happen, so it should be printed out. Um, so this is how this looks like. You can see that I now chose K equals nine, so K, nine nearest neighbors, and I'm using Euclidean distance and this is the optimal classification error that I obtained with this configuration, which is 25% uh, of misclassifications. And as I said, this is already a bit biased, okay? Yeah, so this is not an unbiased estimator for future performance on new data. Uh, sorry. Um, I also already showed to you how you can, um, how you can access uh, the archive. So you peek into the instance, you access the archive and then you convert it into a data table with dollar data. And you can see here um, the unnested parameters that we're optimizing over so k and distance. So this is our grid. So if you're wondering why the parameters are actually ordered maybe a little bit weirdly, so we also um, randomize the order of the grid search um, for some technical reasons. And here you see the um, classification error in this column. So pretty equal uh, um, and again we can plot performance um, and here I'm not only plotting k on the x-axis I'm also coloring the distance parameter so you can see whether that makes a difference right uh, and on the y-axis I obviously have the classification error so you can see here that on average Euclidean distance works well a little bit better a tiny bit better um, okay so Let's make things a little bit more interesting. So how, how about we now want to search over a larger parameter space? So I now want to optimize over K um, from three to 50. And I also want to do this with on, on log scale, as I explained before. I now also want to truly optimize distance. So this parameter of the uh, distance metric as a true double, and I'm going from one to three um, as a real number. I'm also now optimizing over the categorical parameter distance kernel, and I'm optimizing over rectangular, Gaussian, rank, and optimal. And I will also optimize over the Boolean parameter, the logical parameter, whether to scale features or not. So let me define this. So this is now four parameters, a bit more kind of challenging as a search space. And I will also do this log space transformation that I did before as in the slides, 4K. Um, and because this parameter space is now a bit larger, so maybe you don't want to do grid search anymore, right? Because grid search would now exhaustively evaluate everything. This might get quite expensive. So the next best algorithm, if we don't want to do anything too advanced, would be random search, where we can completely control how many uh, evaluations we want to do because it's just randomly samples our search space, also embarrassingly parallel. And then I really have now to set a, a, a termination criterion so I set this again to 36 evaluations as before for the smaller search space and I set batch size to 30 fixed. 
36 again, so that this is completely parallelized. So let me execute this again. And um, yeah, I guess I will skip over this now a little bit because I'm not patient enough to wait again for two minutes. So this again now, and I did this before in my dry run to prepare the tutorials. You can see here how the result looks like. So this has optimized now these, uh, sorry, these four parameters here. You can see the optimal configuration here. You can see that the classification error is now a little bit better. Obviously we should have probably used the larger budget, um, I guess for four parameters and not only 36. And you can see the complete archive here spanning again these four columns and all evaluations. And as you can see, we're also storing all of the resampling results, all of the predictions, all of the evaluations. You can configure this a bit. If you think this wastes memory, you can switch this off. But if you want to peek into all of the computed results, that's definitely possible. And it's just in there. Michel has taught you how you work with these objects. And you just have to access the data table and get it out of this. Um, and here again, I'm now unnesting for the transformation. So if you're annoyed by this K being on log scale, you can unnest here and you can see it on the original scale. I guess we would have to round this also. Uh, no, actually I'm being stupid. It's, uh, I'm, I'm being an idiot. So if we are unnesting the X domain, I have to click here. It's just the, you can see here the unnest, uh, the, the, um, the, the transformed K on the original scale. And of course that's also an integer, yeah, so. I missed it there. Um, and you can do, now do nice things again. You can um, plot uh, with ggplot on the archive. So here I'm, uh, oh shit, I should have done this, sorry. Okay, I'll skip that. So I guess because I should have computed the other thing before. Um, so this actually let me just kind of directly skip to the most interesting part. So um, here, so, I've shown the uh, auto tuner again, so there's not a lot of new stuff in there. So I think the most interesting stuff in terms of the use case here is in the appendix. So in the appendix, we are running the same thing. So I'm running exactly the same task with exactly the same search space and so on, but I'm doing more evaluations. So I'm actually doing um, 3,600 evaluations. So we are increasing the budget by a factor of 100. And because you don't have, so you don't have to pre-compute this, we have actually stored all of the results here in an RDS file. So we pre-computed this a bit. I'm, I'm not sure how long this takes, maybe about an hour or so. Um, again, structurally, the results look exactly the same. It's just now 3,600 rows. But you can now see very nice effects from this if you easily, if you just use ggplot on the archive. So here you can, for example, see K versus classification error, but we colorize points by whether to scale or not. And as you can see, obviously scaling is beneficial and helps, right? And this is what we teach to you, what, what I teach my students, for example, if I uh, teach uh, k &N in a university lecture, I teach them to, um, because it's based on this distance, Euclidean's distance function, usually it's a good idea to kind of become, well, scale independent uh, if features are measured in different units to scale everything before, right? And here you can kind of empirically see this, right? Results are much better if we scale. Of course, I could argue, you could argue, well, I, I know this already, so why should I tune over this? You can shortcut there if you know that. Uh, in some other cases, it's less clear, and it's at least you see these toy examples, it's kind of nice to see this again, right? I can also colorize points by a kernel. And here, this um, the picture is a little bit less clear, right? So there seems to be some patterns in there. So in order to kind of make this a bit more uh, visible, we are now uh, also using Geom Smooth. Um, so this is my kind of more now I'm talking about ggplot and MLR free tuning. Um, you can see here these smoothed um, lines, these average lines. Um, I guess you can see that, I guess what you can at least see if we zoom in uh, is that um, there's apparently also well, there's, there's a certain dependence going on between K and the kernel, right? So depending on what kernel you use, different values of K are optimal. And there's also, well, at least um, a rough dependence also between distance and kernel. So from these very simple plots, we can now already get a lot of information out of that. So scaling seems to be very influential. Setting scaling to true is beneficial. Um, the distance parameter actually seems to be the least influential. 
Um, and there seems to be an interaction between K and kernel and also, well, uh, to a certain extent, not that much actually between distance and kernel. Um, the only part that I skipped here is how to do proper auto-tuning, um, proper nested resampling. But the only reason I skipped that is because it looks exactly the same as on the slides. And I guess I would stop here with this part and now move over to, I don't know, in my opinion, maybe the most interesting part of the tutorial, which would be MLR3 pipelines. Um, Michel, um, have you confirmed that Martin is also already here? Uh, I've chatted with him over MetaMouse. He should be here. here. Yeah. Yes, he is here. Martin is here. This is great. So um, I will now move on to MLR3 pipelines. So what I should also say before is that uh, what I'm presenting here in terms of the third package is to a very, very, very large degree Martin's work. And then I'm not the second author, but Florian Pistara was another PhD of mine. So um, this is also the reason why Martin is presenting the use case. So I'm kind of proudly presenting his work. Um, and like I said, I think this is really at the moment probably the most exciting part of MLR3, yeah? Um, because you can do so much interesting stuff with it and combine it with everything else. So, okay. So what, do, what is MLR3 pipelines about? So it's all about machine learning workflows. So we all know that machine learning consists of a lot more nowadays than just, I mean, taking, um, I don't know, some fixed data set, running your learning algorithm on it, evaluating it, maybe tuning it a little bit. So nowadays, Baron weren't losing you. Um, and to get kind of a lot. Sorry, could you repeat the last bit? Of okay, sorry? is it better? <laughs> yes, now, now we can hear you. Uh, is it better now? Because I'm actually yes. behind the cable connection, so it should be pretty stable. Okay, sorry. Okay. So okay. let me start over again. So MLR3 pipelines is, um, well, about constructing machine learning pipelines or machine learning workflows, okay? Complex machine learning pipelines, complex. So it's kind of a modeling language for machine learning workflows. And um, we all know nowadays that this is pretty important, that machine learning now, applied machine learning is about a lot more than simply taking a kind of completed, already externally pre-processed data set and running a single algorithm on it, maybe tuning it a bit, evaluating it, and then you're done, right? The most important steps of applied machine learning nowadays often happen in feature extraction, feature preprocessing, feature selection. Uh, data is, is quite dirty yeah? nowadays. Uh, you have to kind of do a lot with it um, before you go into your ML algorithm, especially if, if you want to achieve optimal or, or good results. And um, yeah, MLR3 pipelines is kind of a design language in order to allow that to you. And um, if you want to kind of squeeze out the last epsilon of performance, uh, if you look at Kaggle, how people usually win competitions, um, they often use a second ingredient and that's about ensembling, so model averaging, model stacking, and so on. And also, this is also possible with MLR3 pipelines, but MLR3 pipelines actually allows you to do a lot of very complicated things because it's a quite abstract and very general type of, well, workflow language geared towards machine learning. So um, my kind of running example for the beginning is just simple linear pipelines where we, for example, do something like scaling of features, then we encode factor variables because our ML algorithm can only handle doubles. Then we do maybe some imputation to handle missing values, and then we go into the learner. And this is what I would call a linear pipeline. And this is what many people are now, well, I guess are pretty happy with, but MLR3 pipelines can do a lot more. It can actually work on graphs. So, how do workflows look like from an abstract point of view? So we basically have two building blocks. So we have like a computation that's being computed on something. And this is what we call a pipe operator. And this is what you see here as the nodes in the graph. So each of these little nodes here, these pipe operators takes one or multiple input objects. It's com it computes one operation on them. And then, well, it gives out the results, which is usually of one object, but it can also be multiple. Um, and you can also see the structure here, like the connections, these edges that um, specify in what sequence stuff is happening, how the, these computational steps are interconnected. 
that, that uh, control how information flows. And if you, well, combine nodes and edges, well, what you get is a graph. In this case, kind of a computational graph, right? And that, that graph we call a pipeline. I guess we could have also called it MLR3 graphs, but uh, yeah, pipelines is the more popular term. Um, or I guess we could also call pipelines kind of a data flow modeling or data flow programming language, because usually on these, not, not always, but most of the time what flows on these edges here is some, some form of pre-processed data. Um, so let's now start with the pipe operators. How do they work? And pipe operators, in a, certain, in a certain sense, you can think of them as a generalization of an ML algorithm. So you've already understood how an ML algorithm look, works like, right? Like a data goes in and then there's a training procedure and a model comes out. And then there's a predict procedure where also data goes in and then a prediction comes out. Yeah? And pipe operators are kind of a generalization of that. So that they don't necessarily train models, but they do something on data. Well, in a certain sense, you could say they, they also learn something on data. And they, they are objects. So they have a constructor, again, with a nice little sugar. sugar. So you can use these PO, these, this PO function here. And you can construct your pipe operator. And uh, in the beginning, I will use the scale operator as a very simple example, because I think most of you will understand how scaling works. And now, the important thing, and what makes everything a little bit more complicated is that this operator, it's not a single function call, okay? So it's not just one function. It's unfortunately in machine learning, it's always two functions. So it's training and prediction. So what happens in training? So training data goes in, we scale the training data, so we scale each feature, and we transform it into scaled data. And while we are scaling the data, we also store the scaling factor, factors. So usual scaling and statistics, I mean, there's different versions of it. One, one scaling is subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation for each column. And this is what I call the scaling factors here. And this is what you could actually call also learned parameters. So in a certain sense, we are learning them on training data. And here we now store them as we store for a learner, we store the model inside of it. We now store, excuse me, we store these learned parameters. And during prediction, something slightly different happens. So training or uh, sorry, test data comes along. It's again a block of data, data table. We push it inside of the operator, but now we don't learn anything. We simply apply this, the learned scaling factors from training and transform data again goes out. So every pipe operator always has a training function and a prediction function. Yeah. And um, there's actually more complicated operators that have multiple inputs and outputs. So um, I think this type of operator here, we call a pre-processing operator. So for pre-processing, so that's kind of the abstract base class. So for pre-processing operator, always training data goes in, transformed data goes out during training and during prediction, again, data goes in and data comes out. But we have more complex operators and some of them are actually uh, either take multiple inputs or produce multiple outputs. Um, all of them I will show later in more complex examples, so I don't wanna kind of explain them here prematurely. So let's see how this actually looks like in our code. So we construct our pipe operator for scaling and now we train it and operators, because they can take multiple inputs, they are always trained on this. So also what I'm showing here is how the thing works as a single computational step. Later on, you really wouldn't do this by hand because you would connect them in a graph, okay? And in the pipeline and just use that. Just showing this here you can so you can understand how it works. So the training function always takes a list because it can be multiple ob objects. In this case, it's just a simple list of a task. And now we train it. And now we can peek inside and, and the output is also again a list because it can be multiple objects. And here you can see that it's simply, the output is simply the transformed data. So you can see this is the iris task. I think most of you have seen this. And you can see some weird feature values in here for iris. And the reason that these look a bit non-standard is because I've subtracted the mean now and divided by the standard deviation. Um, also, each pipe operator has a so-called state. And the state contains exactly these guys here. So these learned parameters during training. So if you look at the state, you can see that I have a list because we're using the scale function from R that I, I'm guessing most of you guys also have seen before. So that always computes this center list or the center vector, I should say, with the means of each feature and with 
the scalings here, so the standard deviations of each feature. And you can peek into this and look into this. So this is what we have learned during training. And during prediction, well, again, you use your pipe operator, you use your prediction function, again, you use this, and up here, it just created a smaller task. Um, yeah, some of the extra code here is just on there, so you can actually squeeze all of the output on the slides. So it's basically just PO predict from a list on the task, and you can see here how I'm now transforming this new data with the learned parameters. If you want to get a feeling for what's inside of MLR3 pipelines, I guess it's actually best not to look at my slides here, but to look at uh, Martin's uh, web page and our book. Um, but you, all pipe operators, again, are in the dictionary. You can list this, so they, they don't even fit on the slide anymore. There's a lot of stuff in there. So I guess I'm not going to read all of this out. So there's a lot of pre-processing stuff in there, scaling, box, Cox transformations, PCA, ICA, a lot of imputation techniques, a lot of feature selection techniques, especially filtering methods, uh, categorical data in, uh, encoding, so one hot treatment encoding, impact encoding, sampling methods, sampling for class balance corrections, ensemble methods, which you will see later on here, branching, which is also very complex meta type of thing, uh, which allows alternative uh, data flows. So um, there's some stuff already in, it's, there's feature union in there, which we'll also show you later for ensemble construction. There's text processing in there, date processing, and you have some planned stuff for spatial temporal data, some order and stuff, and some outline detection that exists on GitHub in, in various stages of development, but not really in pipelines yet. Okay, so let's make it more interesting. Let's now connect these things uh, into full graphs. So in order to connect stuff, the package gives you a couple of operators. So the most important operator is this pipe operator here. So we kind of uh, created a new R operator and that concatenates different pipe operators in a sequential manner or it concatenates graphs. So what this basically does is, so in the most complex version, you have a partial graph here and that graph has a right-hand side. So it has a couple of nodes which have outgoing edges which are not connected to anything. And then you have a partial graph here which has a left-hand side. And so some of these nodes have incoming edges which are not connected to anything. And these are now connected by this pipe operator. Yeah? In the simplest case, you would have just have something like this here. We just connect this guy to this, this to this, and then this to this, okay? And it also works on more complex partial graphs. And this is obviously important, right? So you can build more complex stuff from simpler elements. And then there's the G-union operator. The G-union operator is something that's not, it's even simpler. So it takes two partial graphs and it creates a new graph out of them by not connecting anything. And then there's a little helper function that's uh, quite useful, for example, in ensembling. So that's called the pipeline rep or G replicate function. And that creates copies of graphs or partial graphs, and then simply merges them together, calls the union operator on them. So you have like 10 different copies of the same element in your graph, which is pretty helpful as you will later see in examples. So let's now have a look at, uh, oh, yeah. And of course, obviously, um, I should also mention how you can get machine learning algorithms from MLR3 into pipelines. Well, there's just an operator, which is called uh, the pipe op learner, and you can put any MLR3 learning algorithm inside of it, and then you get this little pipe operator here, which applies this machine learning algorithm, this MLR3 learner. Um, what you can also do is um, you can wrap each pipeline as a graph learner. So that's basically just a little piece of connecting code. You'll see this in the examples very quickly. So this kind of creates from a pipeline a learning algorithm that's, yeah, this makes a learning algorithm out of this complete pipeline and allows you to use everything from MLR3 again on this, including resampling, benchmarking, tuning, nested resampling, so everything that we've shown to you before. So how does this now work with linear pipelines? Super simple. Write down pipe operator scale, write a pipe operator for encoding, and always connect them with this pipe operator here, uh, sorry, with this, with this uh, pipe thing. Uh, then something for imputation. Maybe we impute all NAs with the medium of the column and then use a decision tree. This thing here creates a linear pipeline. We're basically done. You can now wrap this in a graph learner. And after you have done this, you can now use resample on this. You can use tune on this. You can use benchmark on it. Done. You are now basically in the world, well, in Michel's world, so to speak, in MLR3. And you can, I can, of course, I can train it. 
And if I train this, for example, just to make this clear, what happens is training data is pushed inside of this. We learn the parameters here. We learn factor levels here. We learn feature medians here. And of course, we learn our decision tree in the last step. And in prediction, new data goes in. We scale it with the learned factors. Um, we, with the scaling factors, we uh, do the same encoding for factors. We impute data as we've learned it, and then we apply the decision tree. Um, some um, yeah, um, extra comments on how to uh, practically work with this. So obviously, you can set hyperparameters of all of these pipe operators. So this is a lengthy piece of code, but it's not very difficult to explain. So every graph, every MLR3 pipeline objects contains a list of pipe operators, and this list is named. So all of these pipe operators have IDs. So they have standard IDs, the scaling operator is called scale, but you can rename it, you can call it foo, okay? And then you can access this list here with the ID of the operator. It has a program set, and as for learning algorithms, you can access values and set them. So you can read them out and you can set them. It works exactly in the same manner um, as for MLR3 learning algorithms. So access this list here with the ID and then simply work with the param set. If you can do that, if you can select from a graph each individual pipe operator, you can obviously access the state as I've shown to you before. And you can read out the state of each pipe operator after the pipeline has been trained. And if you set a little debug option, you don't do this by default because it would waste memory, you can also access the result of the pipe operator. So if you do the computation here, so if data, for example, is pushed through the thing, right? So I guess, it, yeah, for example, in training, if data is pushed through this thing, it gets transformed, transformed, and transformed. And maybe you want to see how the data actually looks like, how the object looks like, especially if you want to debug a complex pipeline, that makes sense. So set this debug option and then look at dot result and that gives you the output. Yeah? So what actually is, well, just computed for this step, which is computed here and then flows into this guy. And we can create nonlinear pipelines, uh, which is, I think, the most exciting thing. So some people already asked in the Slido, can I do ensembles with MLR3? Answer is yes. It's actually on this page here, how you can, for example, do your own bagging method. So here I'm creating a pipe operator with subsampling. So I'm randomly selecting like, for example, 80% of my rows of my training data, and then I'm running a decision tree. Now I replicate this three times and then use the pipe operator for averaging. So this would create a graph that looks like this. So I create, I take this, this guy here, replicate it three times, and then do majority voting at the end. It's my own bagged tree. So that's nearly a random forest, right? That I created with two lines of code. And if, it, if you train this, it looks like this. Um, or you can do stacking. So here I'm already doing something pretty complicated. I'm taking a linear model, I'm taking a support vector machine, and I'm using the null operator. I'll explain this in a few seconds. So, and I'm not only creating a pipe operator for the learner, I'm actually creating a pipe operator for cross-validating the learner. So each time I push data in here, the thing gets cross-validated. So some of you guys already know stacking better, and you know that you should actually use cross-validation yeah, in stacking. Um, if you later on create your ensemble on the predictions, so this cross-validates this and pushes out the cross-validated predictions. The same here, and this null operator actually just passes data along. So this actually passes along original feature values. Then I do a feature union so that C binds the, the predictions of this guy, the predictions of this guy with the original features. So I can now do my second level stacking model. I use a random forest. And what this actually does, it, it doesn't only combine these two things, it can now actually combine them in a feature dependent manner. Yeah? So sometimes in literature, that's actually called a gating model, gating, gated stacked model. It's very complex, right? And that, that's this code here, okay? And you're completely free to define variants of this. Yeah, we are not restricting you in any way. Just use your own creativity, implement whatever you want through this mechanism. And I guess the last thing I want to mention is branching. Um, and branching um, allows you to control data flow um, in a complex graph. So for example, you might have some type of feature extraction, feature transformation, and you're not sure whether you should do A or B. So maybe you want to do either a PCA or an ICA, 
to transform your features. So you can create a branch. Um, so you can say data should either flow here and we do the PCA or data should flow here and we do the ICA. And if you use this branch, um, you can use this PPL thing. So PPL is for partial pipeline, so a small graph, and this is basically an abbreviation. So you can construct this very quickly. Um, and this gives you a computational element that has a switch parameter. So you have a control parameter. You can see this here, this control parameter branch, which you can set either to PCA to ICA. And if you set it to PCA, data will flow here. If you set it to ICA, data will flow here. Why is that interesting? One with PCA and one with ICA, two linear pipelines. Why do we need this complicated thing here? If you construct it like this, you will now have a hyperparameter that controls which preprocessing is executed, which means because it's a hyperparameter, you can have AutoML and hyperparameter tuning techniques um, figure it out automatically what works best. And you can have it figure it out automatically even what works best with what learning algorithm and so on. So branching is actually a very nice mechanism to create complex AutoML systems from scratch in MLR3 pipelines. And I have a gallery post online that describes this in a bit more detail than I, than I can do here in this talk. I will skip some stuff now here, which shows how you can actually target specific columns with pipe operators. So every pipe operator can be restricted to certain column subsets. Yeah, for example, by using patterns of IDs for columns or saying, I only want to apply this to, to real valued columns, only to factor columns, that's all possible. And it's very simple. Um, yeah, I have also, um, Uh, can you hear me again? Yes, it's working again. Nice. Oh, okay. Yes, but you. you dropped out for so, um, a second. For, for 20 minutes, right? For a few seconds. I dropped out for how long? Okay, okay. I guess a few seconds are okay. Um, so most of this in this summary I've already shown before. So we have uh, abbreviations for certain pattern, patterns in pipelines. So this is this PPL thing. So um, this actually yeah, creates partial graphs. We haven't uh, compiled many of these things, but we'll add more and more sugar elements. We don't have to create like um, certain elements from scratch. So certain things that everyone always wants to use, we'll kind of store in the package. So you, can, you get these partial graphs and can directly work on them. So at the moment we have stuff, for example, for class balancing and chunking and then other stuff. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll keep this now very short because I'm probably already a lot out of time. So you can, I already said, you can do a lot of nice things with MLR3 for AutoML. So you can kind of also see MLR3 pipelines as a design language to build AutoML systems. We are also ourselves very interested in doing that. So, um, you can actually now create difficult structures and then have your hyperparameter optimizer figure out what works best. So very often you want to construct stuff like that. So different pre-processing methods with different hyperparameters, different machine learning algorithms with different hyperparameters, yeah? uh, different feature extraction methods. So you can use branching yeah? to kind of say either that or that or that. And all of these things have hyperparameters. And at the end, you get a kind of a joint space of all hyperparameters of this pipeline and any tuner can now work on this. Yeah? So you can work with random search or grid search on this, but obviously for these more complex things, you would probably want to use something more efficient like Bayesian optimization and so on to speed up the process in these high dimensional uh, tuning spaces. But it, from a conceptual point of view, it's not different than what I've shown to you before in tuning. And maybe let me directly go to the um, example here. So I guess, Hopefully that convinces you that you can do pretty cool stuff with this. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically writing down this. So there's also a nice plotting function for um, pipelines in the package. So I'm writing down something where I do either PCA for feature extraction or nothing. Okay, so I, I, I stay with the original features. Then I do a feature filter. I do ANOVA to filter down my potentially high dimension data structure. 
Then I do branching again, and I either use a support vector machine, I use gradient boosting, or I use a random forest. And then I'm done. Um, and in order to specify this pipeline, uh, for the complete thing, this is the code you have to write. Branching for PCA, your feature filter for ANOVA filtering, branching for the three learning algorithms with some IDs here that I manually define and some static variables that I define. And then these three partial graphs, I simply pipe together to my complete graph. I put it in the graph learner. I'm, I'm now in MLR3, in the MLR3 build, and I can also use MLR3 tuning on this. And I specifically now want to use MLR3 tuning on this. So I can write down a very, very lengthy parameter set. I can do, I can say which feature extraction I want to use. I can tune the parameters of my ANOVA filter, of my random forest, of gradient boosting, of the support vector machine. I can add actually dependencies in there for a hierarchical space. I can do feature trans uh, uh, parameter transformations. Okay, this is potentially a bit more complex, but this is very powerful. So if you kind of see these two slides together, I've kind of defined a pretty complex automail system already. And this is the hyperparameter tuning for everything, okay? So, okay, that probably takes a few minutes to come up with this, but this is, I mean, it's two pages of code and this uh, does something pretty cool. You can fully parallelize this, you can do nested resampling on this, and you can change it as much as you want. And yeah, it's super definable and flexible. And I know I was probably not fast enough, so apologies to Martin, but this ends my presentation here. And I would now mute myself, Martin. And um, that is the beginning of my presentation. I guess I still need to share my screen. See if this works. Just the two. And uh, share. The, you can see my screen. Great. Yes. So we, we've seen that MLR3 pipelines has a, is a, can, can do a lot of things, and you can go full out and uh, have like stacking and alternative path branching and so on. One of the first reasons why you would need pipelines, though, is pre-processing. And pre-processing you have to do when your when your data is in some way broken or your learner, like your learning algorithm, cannot really work with it, and you need to adjust it to make it com compatible with your data. So this this is one step before you do pre-processing to actually enhance your features where you want to extract something. Here in this um, example I'm showing, we're working with data but it's not really working with the machine learning algorithm we want to use. So this, this example, you can also see online. So we, um, as you will probably also get the link, there's this, this page where everything, all, this, is, this is already rendered and you can also follow, follow the code. So what's happening here is, but we are still using the German credit data that you've seen before, but in this code block, but you don't really need to understand everything that's happening here is that we're introducing missing values. So we're setting some of our data to NA. So if we look at our, our task now, so the task we have created, this has missing values now. I'm also going to initialize some, some seed in a resampling instance. So when we compare stuff, we get a fair comparison. So let's start with MLR three pipelines. So we've seen the, um, quite a few pipe operations, so pipe ops. Question is, what, which ones do we have? And we can just ask the MLR pipe ops dictionary, which is the dictionary that lists basically all of them. Or if we if we are in a hurry, we can also just write PO parentheses because this one just prints us the dictionary. So let, let's start with this. We have a learning algorithm that we want to use, in this case, the ranger, random forest, and we want to train it on our task. But once we do this, we get an error message. So there's missing data, and our, our learner cannot handle this. So now we, we ask ourselves, what are we going to do? We can just impute. So we can ask our um, dictionary of possible operations that we have stored somewhere, what, so what, which ones of, like, of you can we use for imputation? And here it gives us a list. We, have, we can impute with a constant value or with a mode or out of range. You would have to look at these maybe if you, if you want to make an educated decision. 
And the way you do this is that you ask your help. So you ask question mark, um, MLR, pipe ops, and then impute test, for example. So in our studio, this opens a very nice browser help page. And this explains to us what it does, what are the parameters that we can set during construction, and, and everything we would, might want to know about it. So here we're using the out of range imputer. So this one we also get with this quick access function that Bernd already mentioned. So we just say, okay, pipe up, that is called impute out of range or impute OOR. And this gives us a very nice object. So this is our pipe operation. It tells us some things about itself. So what its name is, what hyperparameters does it have? So what things are already set and also the input and output. So this thing, accepts the task and outputs the task, so it's a pre-processing operation. We can, like this operation is, as Bent already said, is basically a um, learning algorithm, like a generalized learning algorithm. So we can train this on data, and now we get the imputed data. So if we, if we remember task dollar missings, we had some missing values. So this is the command that tells us if we have missing values in the task. If we ask the result of this operation here, um, well, I can just run this. This has no missing values anymore. So here the values were imputed. And so what does out of range do? Out of range for categorical parameters basically adds a new category that is out of range of the old categories. It adds a category missing. So before we had um, the credit history has a few levels, it's a factor, category, uh, factor feature, and here we had a missing value. Now it added the new feature missing. This is different from having a missing value, which the learner doesn't know what to do with. This is actually a new category, and that is called missing, and the random forest will have no problem working with that. We can now create a learner from this pipeline. So we, we can get this graph, which does first the imputation and then makes, well, fits a learner. And this, we again have to turn into a learner. So here we are in MLR3 pipelines country. We have a graph and we can add new operations to it, for example, but we want to do ML, use the MLR3 tools. So we want to go back to MLR3 country. So we use create a new graph learner. So, if we look at what this thing in here is, so um, hello. So this thing is a graph. It has it tells us well it uh, consists of operations and they are connected in some ways. And uh, but we, what we want is a learner. So this thing is a learner and uh, we can use it, for example, to train. And see, now we don't have any errors, and um, we, we have a fitted learner now. And we can even uh, resample this thing. So this is going to, well, it has a certain performance. You can, I mean, we, we could also do benchmarks with this, and for example, see what different imputation methods work better or worse in this, in this thing. And the nice thing is that you can use as a more advanced feature, this branching thing that Ben showed, where we uh, have, have the actual imputation of it that is being used as a hyperparameter. So we can make tuning over the method that does imputation. I'm going to skip the feature filtering. And, um, uh, I'm going to go straight to the robustification. So because it, it, it um, fits better into this, into this, um, into this uh, narrative. So an, another way in which your learner can fail is that it is trained on, on features that are constant, for example or that it tries to predict a feature that has, or that it tries to predict on a um, level that has not been seen before on a factorial level. So I'm creating a task here, but it's a very small subset of the whole training task. 
So what, why am I doing this? It's a um, certain feature of this uh, specific data that in the few uh, first few features, there are things that are constant. So for example, this feature, the first 30, no, not this one, but um, a few features of these, they, they're basically the same value for the first few um, rows. Um, no, sorry, they, they are not constant, but the problem is the first few 30 rows, they have some, there are some features that occur in the task that are not seen in the first 30 rows. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to predict a value that has not been seen before. So the, and the random forest complaints, uh, the logistic regression complaints. So I'm trying to um, predict on a feature that we haven't seen. So also, and now here we see the constant thing. Suppose we just have just two rows and we're trying to train a model on this one. Obviously this is destined to fail for various reasons, but one of the reasons is, well, we have some features that are not changing at all. So, and here we get the error message. There are some constant features and logistic regression doesn't like that because it gives a, uh, uh, well, zero determinant matrix. So what do we do in this, in this case? What we can do here is we just collect all the different kind of operations we have that can fix the individual issues. So, and we, we, because it makes the learner more robust, we call this robustify. So we say, okay, we, we might have a problem of missing, of, of features that occur in the prediction um, side that we haven't seen during training and the learner will fail. So we use the pipe of fixed factors, which removes um, features that we're not seeing during training and turns them into missing values. Next, we have to remove constant values, uh, remove constant features. So and there's a pipe up for that as well. It's like an uh, iPhone advertising for everything. You have a certain small tool that can do exactly what you want. And in the end, what we also have to do is we have to impute because we had fixed factors removed some features as uh, some, some values. Now we have missing values. So we also need to impute these. And here we have to be careful. We cannot impute out of range because that would just be us introducing another set of missing values again of, of, of unseen factor levels. So a feature I'm, I'm showing now is that, well, we have this graph. I, I printed a graph before already, but so this is the representation. It doesn't, it's not very convenient. So we don't really know what's happening. So we have a plot function. And the plot function, well, gives us a very nice representation. And here we have the linear graph. This can obviously get much more um, scary, as you've seen in the slides from Bend. You can you can have lots of different, um, well, paths that go parallel and so on. A nicer way to represent this is to have HTML equals true, because this gives us an HTML representation. This is um, a well. This is JavaScript doing some fancy things and. You can play around with it. It's, it just looks nicer and you can also zoom. So now we have this robustify pipeline that does all these things. So it does a uh, fixed factors room of constants and field sample, and we feed this into logistic regression. So now we can train this on our completely broken task. I mean, this thing had like uh, two, two rows and so on, and, but we can, we can train on this now because all the constant features were removed and we can predict on it without trouble. Even though we, we trained on a completely broken task that was not only had only two, two rows with um, constant features, but also the predicting task has lots of features, uh, lo lots of, lots of um, values that were not seen before. Whether training on a data set with two rows gives you a good predictive performance is a different question. So 
and now we've seen, well, you have to do quite a few things to get this, uh, to get everything to work. I'm sorry for about the noise here. So uh, how, how nice would it be if, well, our package gave you a way to just build these things automatically and not having to remember what everything to do to robust makes stuff robust. And here we actually have something. This is also what Ben already showed, the uh, partial pipelines. Here we have a few prepackaged solutions for problems that you might encounter. And one of these is obviously you want to make something robust. So, and how, how does this work? So we can just ask, okay, uh, give us something to make stuff robust. And we get the pipelines, but this is a very uh, big and complicated pipeline. Why is that? Because this thing tries to be uh, ready for all the eventualities. So uh, you say, well, maybe my learner cannot handle missing values, so I have to do imputation. Maybe my learner cannot handle factor values, so we have to encode to get um, to get numeric values, numeric features. Instead, we can also give this uh, thing a few arguments. We can say, well, we give you this task we want to handle, we give you the learner that we have, and um, we run this, and this gives us a much smaller graph now. So it's not this huge anymore. It's just noticing, well, the few things it actually has to do. So it's, it doesn't need to encode stuff anymore because our learner can handle factorial features. Instead, it only does the necessary things. And this one, we can also train into prediction and we, it, it learns the same way it did before. So um, <coughs> I think we are very close to finishing. Maybe there are a few questions we should answer. Um, there was the question if we can um, if we can implement our own pipe operations. So, and I already answered with the link, but I think it's it's nice to show this. All of this works with R6. So, um, it is it is um, possible to implement your own operation just by inheriting from this class. And then the only functions you actually have to implement are like training and the prediction function. And you can look at our documentation and see it is, well, it, it looks scary because it's so long, but actually this is just, we give you lots of examples to learn from. The principle is very easy. Um, any other questions? Um, maybe someone else can help me. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there were a couple in Slido. I think I see one. It says uh, because PCA I'm is now busy that. answering questions. And okay, I see. <laughs> I'm answering everything by typing already. I just uh, I'm, I'm a yeah. short typer. I'm, I'm doing so, it. Okay. Well, um, um, a few things to say maybe. So th this is obviously not enough time to go through all the depths of what is possible. I think it's nice to show like a very cool feature we have, which is that we can do the stacking and how this actually looks in practice. So all you do is just, well, I want to do uh, stacking. So what, what, what learners do I want to do stacking with? And I just create all the pipe operations for these learners. Maybe I also want to do other things like pre-processing. And now all, all that we have to do is put this before a feature union operator. And as before, we can, we can plot this and we get these graphs and we can add even more. So we can do a second level of stacking. All we have to do is just to uh, build this graph unit by unit and then put them together. So you, you, can, you can work with this like you would with Lego bricks. You would just build everything together and in this way kind of create your own machine learning algorithms from its building blocks. Martin, if I, if I can answer two questions um, from sure. Slido, because that would be easier, easier, to, easier to do it orally. Mm -hmm. So one question was, uh, is, it, is it like safe or recommended um, currently to switch over from MLR2 to MLR3? And um, my answer would, is that it's actually now I think kind of the perfect point in time to do this because the package has is mature now 
So the last kind of big API change we did about one or two months ago with MLR3 tuning, that was basically renaming two or three functions a bit and introducing BBOTK. So that did break API a bit because of the renaming, but the concepts didn't change. And after we did that, we won't do anything else. The packages are well tested already. We have a lot of uh, unit tests online. Uh, we test very, very heavily. Um, and I would even say that, I, I mean, we use it also, I mean, in my research group, we begin using it now for our own experiments and our own research. And I would heavily recommend to make the switch now if there's not some specific individual reasons for you to, because you have like hundreds of thousands of code uh, with the old system, I would definitely now switch. Um, you can, we can discuss what is like worse in MLR3 compared to MLR2. Maybe Martin and Michel have to help me here a little bit. So from my perspective, so what is worse? I really hate that we don't have Bayesian optimization at the moment, um, but we work on that. Um, and depending how urgently you need that, and Martin has also wrote a little connector package that connects MLR MBO, which is MLR2, yeah, with MLR3 pipelines, that's possible. It's a little bit weird how we do that. And it's, it's in a certain sense, it's a bit suboptimal because we like mixing two big, different package versions. So that's, that is an existing downside. And I want to work heavily on this. We have a sprint next week, and that will be an important topic of the sprint to get Bayesian optimization into place. Uh, of course, we don't have 160 learning algorithms currently in MLR3, but the MLR3 learners package plus the MLR org in the background have a lot of interesting stuff already there. And like migrating an, a learning algorithm from MLR2 to MLR3 is, can be about one hour of work. So if you're missing, I think the most important stuff is there. I guess nobody has used these 160 algorithms to, like, like uh, together or exhaustively. And the important stuff we already migrated. And if you're missing something very specific, migrating that yourself or talking to us is also super simple. Um, and beyond that, I mean, Michel and Martin, I'm not sure whether you can come up with something so that MLR2 is a lot better. Maybe, maybe it's not, it's not um, directly related, but it's uh, very important to say this. You will run into trouble if you have both the old and the new MLR loaded into the same R session. So that, that is something to watch out for. So you, unfortunately, you cannot use the one and the other directly next to each other. You would, you would have to, if you run like one script or like if, if you have your R session open, you should have either the one or the other. Otherwise, you run into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You had the same problems if you loaded MLR2 and Carrot, I guess, because the names are just identical. So both packages implement a train function and yeah, the name is special. The one shadows the other. Um, and then, I mean, but I guess you're okay with me like mentioning these downsides and anything else. There's not much, right? And there's much is already a lot better. Yeah. So parallelization is a lot better. Pipelines is a lot better. And I was also asked what's kind of the most important feature that MLR3 has that kind of uh, stands out is if you compare it to Carrot, uh, to tidy models and other stuff. Uh, my answer was basically, I guess, pipelines. So I think. I don't think many other packages have this super flexible, cool system that we have there and like the flexible combination with everything else. And I would say, so I know Andreas Müller from scikit-learn very well. And we actually talked about this topic. So I, if, uh, I think if you, if you haven't tried to publish a paper on this, uh, if you compare like the pipelining that we can currently do in MLR3 pipelines compared to what you can do with normal scikit-learn, I would say, I would argue that we are actually, we have, not that mature and like not that complete in terms of uh, uh, um, provided functionality, but in terms of flexibility and underlying structure and mechanism, I would say we are uh, quite a bit more flexible yeah, in general. Maybe another upside to MLR3 compared to the old MLR is that you can, because we use R, R6, it's very easy to find out what you can do with an object. You just in our studio, you write object and then dollar, and then you have this um, tab completion. It shows you all the things you can have, like you have a task and dollar, and then you have the option of getting the data, of filtering, of uh, selecting rows. In, in MLR, you sometimes have this trouble that, well, you can do a lot of with these objects, but you always have to remember what the function names were. 
Yeah, and if I can add to that, um, I think Martin is completely spot on here. Uh, I would I would phrase this. I mean, I wouldn't rephrase it, but I would just add one important point, and that's like container objects, right? So what like what you get back from the functions. So in MLR two, it was always off. It was often a complicated like nested type of list in list in list uh, types of things. So in MLR three, it's nearly always a data table that you can directly program on. Uh, that always has the same structure. So everything basically looks like a resample slash benchmark um, result object. So it's a, it's a task, it's a learner, it's maybe a configuration and it's a metric and so on. So it, it immediately makes sense. And if you go from like resampling to benchmarking to tuning, just more columns are added that are the same structure. So you don't have to remember much, just have to remember that structure. And then, I don't know, be, be a good data table user, I guess, yeah? Or dplyr, also fine. That's also fine, yeah? yeah. You, have to, you, you have to know how to work with tables. And I, well, I guess every good R programmer should really know how to work with tables. And it, I, we think that's a really good interface to stuff, yeah? Because in data science, everything is kind of a table. Not everything, but many things. Sometimes things are also graphs. So I think we are up, like we are over time right now already, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, we, are, we are kind of perfectly in time because uh, <laughs> we, we started like eight minutes late. Yes, that's why. So I just wanted to thank you all, Bern, Michelle, and Martin. Uh, for giving this webinar and for allowing us to host you as well. Um, so this um, webinar was recorded and it will be made available through YouTube. So thank you again. And um, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the meetup and maybe I can pass them along to either of you um, so we can um, answer them for you. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Can I, add, can I add two sentences? So of course you can pass the questions along. Um, we are very active on GitHub and very active online. So I think the easiest way to get in contact with us is go on the, the various issue trackers, talk to us there. We have a MetaMost. It's also possible to join that. You can ask questions to us on Stack Overflow. It's all possible. And uh, thanks uh, to your patience. I think, I mean, it was, a, it was three hours, which was long and was a lot of material. So I guess we could have also done like five hours. Um, so apologies for maybe overdoing it a bit, but we really wanted to show the full strength of the thing. And we have a lot of stuff online where you can kind of in your own time go through this again. So apologies if this was quite stressful. Oh, no, it was great. At least, you know, it's a good like starting point. And I'm sure like many people will go through the recording again uh, more slowly, maybe. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's okay. Thank you again. Uh, do you have anything else to add, Michelle? No, thank no. you. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. So I will be uh, ending the uh, meeting now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>